What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 445. My name is Marshall, owner of Limited Resources, and joining me on the line, a special guest, first time officially on the show, it's Woodrow Angle. Woody, what's going on, buddy? How's it going? Hey, everybody. Good, man. So Woody, for those of you that don't know him, is one of my best friends. We've known each other for a long time through poker and magic. And uh, he also shows up on my vlogs on the MTG Breakdown channel quite routinely. And I figured this would be fun to have uh, Woody on because, Woody, in many ways, you represent a certain segment of our listener base uh, and one that we aim for quite frequently on the show, which is kind of aspirational pro tour players and uh we're going to be talking to you about that today you stoked yeah super pumped yeah so obviously woody's uh been around since the very beginnings of lr in fact you've been around since like the very beginning of lr yeah i was actually uh, i was i was in the room when it the idea came to fruition because it all yeah. sort of happened at a poker game that we all used to play and i remember you and uh ryan saying oh we should you know we should be recording these conversations that we had so yeah yeah pretty- totally I remember that too. And yeah, you were actually there. Not many people were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, let's get into the show here. Uh, Woody, the first thing that we do on limited resources, I don't know if you know this, is we crack a pack, my friends. So. Oh, yeah, news to me, but let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's see what we've got here. Um, first card out is Dovenant Trapper. Uh, where, yeah. where, where are you at on the trapper wood? I think I underrated that card initially, and it's been mm-hmm. climbing up, you know, especially in draft and sealed, not so much, but yeah, I think it's fine. Mm-hmm. It's just like whatever. Uh, speaking of underrated, how about cold water snapper? Cold water snapper, yeah, that's a that's a good one. Hexproof is just it's uh, it's not a very fun mechanic, in my opinion, but man, it's a good one because you just know really what's going to happen. You know, you play it and it's just going to sit there, it's not going to be messed with, it's great. Yeah, and and they you know put it in the set that has two different pretty darn playable uh, auras, right? right? You could put Arcane Flight on it, which is fine, um, but you know more importantly, you can put On Sarah's Wings on Coldwater Snapper and just have this like extremely difficult to interact with wind condition that is so solid because it brings you even if you've managed to fall behind, it immediately you know stabilizes your board both on blocks and attacks and through life gain so yeah it's a good card i mean the card just is is a good finisher and it's one you should be looking for right uh fervent strike uh i haven't played much of that one although i i have seen uh uh a friend of ours i uh i can't recall his name but somebody in a, a little side draft that we did ended up drafting the almost completely mono red all one drop deck that had the two two you know the the one that becomes a two two haste when it has creatures mm-hmm. and he was just playing every low cost instant or sorcery so maybe that's the like calcano deck of the format that people haven't been exploring but other yeah than the that, mono red deck is kind of a thing um you can play warlords furies and stuff to yeah. stock your graveyard for those uh g2 lava runners the card you were talking about right. and uh you can even play uh flame of keld in those decks and it actually performs uh reasonably yeah for an f uh <laughs> next one is arbor armament that's the the green instant put a plus one plus one counter charge creature. That creature gains reach until end of turn. Mm-hmm. You know, this card really just hasn't seen play. I, yeah. I guess this format's just not about efficient or cheap uh, combat tricks because both of these cards are totally fine. Like yeah. Fervent Strike and Arbor Armament are both fine magic cards and they see virtually no play. They're yeah. just not factors. This know. is this is the card that comes in when you don't have any removal and you just die to a bunch of flyers and you're you're still sad. <laughs> yeah, and you're yeah. desperate. You know, yeah. one other time I have brought it in or against um burn spell decks. Like I've brought it in when I have like a five toughness uh creature like a mammoth spider or something along those lines and I know that my opponent is running like multiple fiery interventions and I'll bring an arbor armament as a way for me to potentially blank like a five mana removal spell. Yeah. That that is a, a a spot where it can perform, though it's narrow, right? Because like, for example, if they happen to be like red black, you might just not want to do that because they may just eviscerate it anyway. You right. know, in, in which case it doesn't help. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I have though done that a couple of times and uh I mean, a couple of times over the amount of drafts I've done isn't a lot, but it does come up. I've eaten one, um, Sarah Angel. I don't expect it to get any better. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you peaked. Yeah, uh, Dark Bargain. 
Uh, I love that card. Yeah, I like Me it. I, I don't. I don't take it super highly, but yeah, I love to have one or two in my in my deck. Yeah, I love that card too. It just goes so well with the ramp options in green as well. So right. green blacks uh, one of my favorite color pairs. Uh, Call the cavalry. Four mana. Two 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 knights with vigilance. Fine card. Yeah. It's like, good. I just don't. I don't play white that much, though. No. Um, this card's gone down a bit. Ancient Animus, one in a green instant. The uh, put a plus one plus one counter target creature if it's legendary, and then whichever you're targeting fights another creature. Right. Feels closer to Arbor Armament than you know than we initially thought. You know, it's kind of one of those yep. like I didn't draft enough removal, so I have to play this card. Yeah, definitely. And and I will play it if if I am playing like this sort of green ramp deck with like, you know, if I ended up having to play a primordial worm as well as a couple of spiders or whatever, it's fine. It will kill something of note. Uh, I do find the chance for me to use it on an actual legendary creature comes up fairly rarely because they're already such lightning rods in the format. And then on top of it, yeah. like, if you're going to target it with ancient animus, it's just like just begging. Yeah, you're, you're exposing yourself to a lot of risk. Yeah. Uh, Power Stone Shard uh, no, hasn't yeah. really made an impact in the format. I've tried. Side, <laughs> next, yeah. <laughs> Sideboard card, uh, Unwind. Here we go. This is a good one. This is the one that I would take currently, I believe. It's Death Bloom Thalid. Yep. I would have that as, as my front runner, too. That card just, you know, you just always get your get your value. You know, you get to trade, leave, oh, yeah. leave something back that might be relevant, especially if you're in the black green deck. And, um, synergizes with a lot of cards it makes all your vicious offerings better and your whisper better and all that stuff so it's also um really good stats wise a three two matches up well against the slew of one threes that you're liable to face in this format so right. i like that uh next one real real dud uh goblin war chief no that yeah. card's just never done anything Next card is kind of good, I guess. It's Joyra's Familiar, four mana, two, two flyer, and it makes your historic spells cost one less. Really overall been disappointed by the the familiar. I don't prioritize it. I've run it occasionally, yeah. but it just feels like as a four mana spell, it's not doing quite enough. Mostly, uh, I put this in when I need to untap Traxos. <laughs> That's about it. There you go. <laughs> uh, our legend is... That's a good one. It's Raf Capish and Ship's Mage. Two blue, white, three, three, flash, flyer. You can cast historic spells as though they had flash. Guy's good. Yeah, that's a good one. It's uh, question is, would you would you take it over Death Bloom Thalid as a as a gold card? It's um it's tough. There there are a lot of the gold ones that I would take. Like I would take Tatiova first, I think. Uh, uh -huh. the, the hard part is committing to white in any way early for a gold card, because white has been kind of the the default worst color i think in uh i think so too yeah yeah which i i'm actually not sure i i think red might actually be the worst color in sealed and white might be the worst one in draft but uh i'm not i'm not sure if you have them separate you know because the, the ag aggressive strategies in sealed haven't been coming together but yeah i don't know i, mm -hmm. I think i would take valid at this point yeah, I think that Raf probably is for me just just good enough to go for the gold card over the Thalid. I think I would take Raf, although we do have a rare here. Oh, let's take a look. And it's kind of like a super gold card, except for it's not actually gold. It's Tempest Gin. Oh. Triple blue for an 04 flyer, but it gets plus one plus 0 for each island. Basic island you control. That's a card I actually kind of like first picking. Um, you know, because you can really prioritize cutting blue early and uh -huh. uh, I mean, it's just, yeah, I first picked that actually, uh, just recently I made day two of Vegas and that was my first pick in my first draft. Um, and it made it, it made it easier, you know, like when you, it's getting it second pack where it's really awkward, but if you get it first pack, you know, there's a lot of good blues, a pretty deep color, you know, and it felt like, mm -hmm. it felt like, uh, you know, without having to wreck my draft too much, I, I was able to make it pretty playable you know a 10 island deck yeah and the and the payoff's real i yeah. mean that thing is absurd especially like if you play it on turn three. Oh yeah uh you get a three three flyer on turn three is like what the you know your opponent's looking at it like this isn't fair they need you know wizards lightning or untap into you know one of the hard removal spells just for your three drop like you're you're living the dream there right. i think i would actually take raf capuchin i don't know i th this is actually a really tough one between these two i would take both of these over death bloom Thalid, yeah. though uh -huh. yeah they're uh -huh. just too much more powerful but i th they're both have the same issue which is just extreme mana commitment problems but uh but they're both kind of asking different things of you yeah um i, I think, yeah. For I, me, think I would take raf though i think for me it would be between tempest and and death bloom just because uh you know if you take death bloom you get away from blue kind of cleanly you know like i know that signaling in the first pack isn't a huge red flag but you know if somebody's going to take 
the the gin second. They're really going to be trying to cut blue, so you might you might open up another option for you. But I think I would take the gin first. Okay. Yeah. That's an interesting pack. And mm -hmm. boy, has this format really held up? We're, we're just starting to look away from it now and look towards M19 in the yeah. next coming shows. But still, boy, I, I have been super, super impressed by Dominaria Draft uh, as it's as it's held its uh, its value and, and also just love playing it still. It's been excellent. Okay, Woody. Yeah, it really yeah. has. All right. So we're going to talk to you, Woody, uh, for just a bit here. I'm going to be answering a bunch of listener questions um, shortly that I got from the Patreon um, that I actually asked them to ask me questions specifically, and I'm going to be answering those. But first, I wanted to talk to you, Woody, because you and I had an interesting discussion earlier in the week, and I wanted to kind of see if we could bring that to the show about a few things. Uh, you know, want to like I should tell people like kind of where you're at with your magic career, right? Sure. Um, so that so that they have an idea because a lot of the listeners will know who you are. I've mentioned you on the show a hundred times, and like I said, you're in all my vlogs and stuff like that. But um, but some of them won't. And <clears throat> basically, again, Woody's a, a you know one of my best friends for a long time, but has been on you know a, a career arc that is similar, I think, to a lot of our listeners' career arcs. And I think that Woody represents kind of the high end, you know, of our listeners. Woody's played on the Pro Tour two different times, um, one for top eight in a GP and uh, another one for winning a PTQ. And, uh, you know, is a Pro Tour aspirational player, though not necessarily trying to become a full-time Pro Magic player as Woody does have a career uh, as a digital artist in the games industry that he's not trying to, to jump ship from. But, you know, when I think about our listener base, you know, it's, it's broad, right? There's a lot of different, there's, there's players that are relatively new to the game. I mean, our podcast really isn't for people that are brand new to the game. Uh, it'll be a bit overwhelming. I think, uh, I mean, everybody's welcome to listen, but you know, I, I would assume that the way we talk and the concepts, the concepts that we talk about are a little bit deep for somebody who's still figuring out, you know, what's the difference between a creature and a sorcery or whatever. Right. But you know, once you kind of get your hands dirty a little bit, play a couple of pre-releases or a few drafts, you know, I think that's the time to come on. But again, we try to aim the show at a wide range and we will take certain shows where we kind of take the gloves off and say, no, that this is for our hardcore listeners, the people that are grinding PTQs and trying to make it onto the pro tour. And then some of our concepts are more um, broad, you know, and, and aimed at a, at a listener base that is uh, still in the learning phase a little bit earlier. And then, you know, we hope that those serve as a, reminder and solidifier for our PTQ best based players. Um, but again, Woody is somebody who's, you know, again, played on the pro tour twice and kind of knocking at the door. And since we know that a lot of our listeners are in that same position where they're really trying to, to get to that point of uh, being able to play on the pro tour or qualify for the pro tour, that kind of thing. Uh, I kind of wanted to get an idea, Woody, from you, what it was like when that actually happened, because, you you have you've made it to that point where you've you know now qualified for two different pro tours and uh, you know as a somewhat archetypical listener for us i wanted you to explain to us what actually happens when you get there and qualify for the pt so um let's use your your last qualification as an example the one that you won the ptq on sure. what, what actually happens like when you when you win a ptq does does somebody from wizards jump out of a room and say <laughs> like give you a hug and a blue envelope or like what happens well yeah uh, from a uh administrative standpoint you just you get an email right that says you know you, mm -hmm. thank you congratulations for making the pro tour you get uh uh, some information about how to book your travel, uh, things like that, where it's going to be. You get the important dates, like the dates for your deck submission and, you know, information about the format and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. From a mental standpoint, the, as soon as you queue, like you've obviously done something awesome. So you're just really stoked and you're not really thinking about the, the actual uh, mechanics of how you're actually going to do things at the Pro Tour. You know, you have that day yeah. or whatever where you're like wow i just you know because normally you know if you've just top eight at a grand prix or you've, if you've won a pro tour qualifier or you've top four at a regional pro tour qualifier you've had this day where you just couldn't lose you know like so you're just yeah you're, you're kind of high on that right so right uh, so that well, and also yeah. it is interesting that you mentioned that would because the it is an accomplishment in and of itself. Right. Yeah. And even though, you know, you, you're actually going to do something else with it, just qualifying for the pro tour is a big, 
accomplishment. Yeah, know? and I find magic is is a lot like that. It's like this kind of big ladder with a bunch of rungs, you know. And, and when you start off, you've got these kind of small accomplishments. You're like, I want to win F and M, right? So you, you you do that. But then when you get there, there's more ladder ahead of you. You're like, okay, well, I want to go to a Grand Prix, and maybe I want a day two. Then you do that, and then now you now you're starting to day two consistently, and you the next rung is I want to top eight one. That happens. You make it to the PT, and it, this can sometimes feel like that was going to be the last rung on the ladder. I've qualified for the pro tour right. and now I'm playing. And then you realize, you know, you go do one and in like my first PT, I day two, but I think I finished uh, maybe six and eight, you know, like not a super impressive mm-hmm. record. And then you, you realize there's more ladder, right? Like I, I want to do good yeah. at the PT, you know? So um, yeah, it's, it's crazy how your, your goal just kind of keeps moving, moving forward. And like the, the thing that you want to achieve it tends to get harder and harder and harder, you know? So it's, uh, it's definitely a lot of people, they can burn out like that, you know, like, I mean, that what, what it takes to make you happy just gets less and less frequent or less and less likely to happen. So right. it's good to kind of step back and, and remember that I've been teaching my girlfriend magic recently and she's, you know, she's down on the ladder. She's at the early stages where, you know, uh, I was kind of just teaching her the mechanics and then she won a trophy on magic online and she's like i can't believe it you know i got got there i won a trophy and you're like that's right like Mm -hmm. that that used to be where i was climbing to you know and then you it puts it into perspective you know you're like well maybe i am i'm doing pretty good (laughs) it's 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 nice you know yeah yeah do you do you think that uh that that magic attracts people that are like that like you know one of the things i've always said is that i i really enjoy hobbies and pursuits that have a very high ceiling, right? right? Like one where I can't hit it. You know what I mean? Like I I think about the hobbies that I've really dedicated myself to like magic poker photography. And I'm like, there's always something to learn. Like every single time you feel like you've leveled up, right? Like basketball is like this too. You know, you think, okay, I'm working on my jump shot, you know, and now I'm starting to hit these shots in the game. And like, I kind of did that. And then it's just like, but I can't dribble, (laughs) you know, I can't, uh, you know, I, I, I can't play defense or, you know, and then you start getting into these little like, oh, I don't have a spin move or my left hand isn't very good or, you know, I don't have a fade away. And like there's all literally always something that you're not, you know, getting to the point that you really want to be at. Right. Do you think that magic attracts people like that? Definitely. Yeah. I was listening to the, you know, the 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 podcast last week, you know, where you're talking to Ben Stark and Huey. And, and that was um, I can't remember mm-hmm. if they mentioned it specifically, but that's the that's one of the predominant factors is that competitive competitiveness, you know, like Mm -hmm. all of the, you know, for example, like, uh, you know, Huey, Huey's won worlds, you know, and, and that's, that's basically the best you can possibly do in magic. Right. And by, by, by any measure, you know, he should be able to just say, well, I've done it. You know, I've done it. I can pack up. And, mm-hmm. But he's not right. He's still back mm-hmm. there, every, and he just feels he's never going to be satisfied, right? He always wants to do better, and uh, and that's what makes Huey Huey. You know, it's it's a blessing and a curse because, like, you know, you have to be ready for the fact that you could actually make it all the way to Worlds and win it, and still be like dissatisfied with your performance at the next tournament. It's this never ending thing, but it's kind of that's what you're biting off when you're going to be a spike. You know, it's just that's just kind of yeah. how we how we live our lives. Yeah. And I think that the, the interesting part about that is kind of embracing a lot of that. Right. Yeah. And that can be really hard to do because like, let's talk about that episode. Um, I got a overwhelmingly great response for it. I was yeah. really happy about I that. I, I, yeah. Thank you. I, I wasn't yeah. sure what, what, when I put it up exactly how it would go, but I was super, super happy to see the emails and the tweets and the comments and stuff. Um, just given, you know, the amount of uh, effort that a show like that takes, I wasn't sure how much better it would be. And it was really well received. So that's great. And it makes me, of course, want to do more of them. But what stood out to you? Uh, I mean, look, that show was aimed at you, man. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like the, I, I mentioned it at the top of the of that episode about kind of what we were trying to accomplish with it. And the type of person that I said, you know, you're looking to get to the next level. Now, everybody's looking to get to the next level. And I decided to examine the highest level that I have access to. And and in fact, the highest level that exists in the game to do so. But the key is that I'm focusing on that transition, right? That what, what is it about the players that are doing the thing that I want to do? Uh, why are they different than me? You know, and and what stood out to you from the episode? Was there anything that, that 
you know, yeah. was a sticking point for you? Uh, yeah, I liked when Huey was talking about, you know, how you're going to have to be mentally prepared to just lose a lot of magic, you know, just based on the math, right? Like, oh, yeah. Like, I can't remember what they said. John Finkel is 60. Yeah, 63% or something. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's that's quite a stat. Like, I mean, if you think about playing 100 matches and losing 47 of them, well, I mean, that sounds like you're losing a lot, you know, and you are. Definitely. It's, it's uh it's really tough. And I, I haven't been the best at this. Like, you know, Marsh is, uh, <laughs> has definitely been working on my <laughs> expectations management because it's hard, you know, like the thing that he said is true, right? You, you know, you spend a bunch of time practicing for a, a Grand Prix and you pack your bags and you fly all the way out there. And then, you know, you, you get mana screwed a couple of times or somebody just has a really, really good deck that you can't beat. And that's it. Like, it feels like you're like, why did I do this? You know, and that, that is mm -hmm. a, that's a really common feeling. And, uh, and it, it definitely helps to, to focus on not the end result of the tournament, but just realize like, look, if I'm doing everything that I'm doing correctly, then I have this percentage to win each of my matches. And eventually, just like if you're flipping coins and you get to, um, let's say you get, you get to land on heads, you're betting on heads and you get to land on heads 60% of the time somehow, like you have a coin that's just weighted mm -hmm. properly where you'll get 60%. Mm -hmm. The frequency at which you'll flip heads 13 times in a row and then top eight a Grand Prix is just going to be way higher than the average person who's just right. a normal coin, right? So Yeah, and, and that's the pursuit that you're going for, even yeah. though it doesn't feel like it. I, I made sure to really try to hammer that point that I took from our my two guests on the last one where I've mentioned that not trying to win, right? Right. Like your, your focus point isn't, it feels very weird to say that. And when I recorded it, I thought this, people might think this sounds stupid, but it's true, which is that you, your goal in magic or any of these sort of long-term edge based, you know, pursuits where you're dealing with randomness and stuff isn't about winning. You just don't sit down and say, I'm going to really focus on trying to win this tournament or win this match or whatever it's like well that's not how these things are actually fundamentally structured the way that they're actually structured is that you face decisions over and over and over and over and over and over and a lot of the decisions are relatively simple and you know the vast majority of competent magic players would make the same one but as the decisions get more complicated and more subtle then you have a chance to make slightly better decisions repeatedly right. than what your competition would do. And then the end result of that is that if you do that over enough time, you will experience success on, on the level that you actually expect. But the problem is, is that like when you walk into a, a tournament hall and you've been practicing all week on magic online and you sit down and you're confident, and you shuffle up and you think I'm going to, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to win this tournament. It's just like, that's just not what your goal should be because that's unrealistic. Yeah. Right. That's just not like, you should understand that winning will be a byproduct of your hard work and your focus and your consistent application of good play and good decisions. But you shouldn't under you know you shouldn't ever think I'm going to walk I'm going to walk in and win a tournament. That's just asinine. Like right. you're just you're fooling yourself. You know. Yeah. I, so like a good example uh, at the at the draft at uh, GP Vegas, I had a spot where I ended up losing a game because of a, a top decked card, right? And I would say. Five years ago, my focus would have been just like, wow, I got really unlucky, right? This time I was tilted, but I thought I had punted, you know, because I thought that I had made a, a bad play that gave him this out, right, that, mm -hmm. that did that. Mm -hmm. And then you and I ended up discussing it, and we started to piece it together, and we're like, okay, well, maybe actually if you take the other line, he has more potential outs in his deck because it, it ended right. up being between – you know, whether or not he was going to top deck this very specific card that made a card unblockable and let, and let me die or him just top decking a removal spell, which he's more likely to have in his deck. And then when we get to all right. the end of that, you realize maybe it actually wasn't the worst play, but then you're tilted because you didn't think about this at the time. And you should have been right. Like, right. like Ben Stark would yep. have, right. Ben Stark would have seen both of those scenarios and he would have made the one, he, he might've came to the same decision, but he would have thought about it, you know? And that those yep, are the things that sure. end up bothering you like later. So you're, you're signing up for an emotional roller coaster when you, <laughs> when you decide you're going to like scrutinize your game to that level. But it's, yeah, it's kind of the only yeah, way. Yeah, but I think that that's, that's kind of what Huey was saying yeah. too, right? He's like, he, he did, he was saying 
like I think his main point wasn't just that you're going to lose a lot and that that sucks. Yeah, it's it's that that's what you're signing up for. Right, like that's literally the thing that you're when you when you pay the money to you know get into the tournament or when you qualify for a tournament. That's what's going to happen. And right. if there's any question in your mind that that about that, then you should probably consider something else. Just because like <laughs> that's just it. You know, that's just how it works. I mean, we you and I were talking earlier about talking about win percentages and what reasonable expectations you could have for yourself, right? And you looked up your win percentage at the GP level, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, it was. It was like what, just right around sixty? Is like six, sixty-two percent or something like that? I think. Yeah. yeah, and you know, so and those numbers are like Woody's played enough to have like a sample size that's you know approaching reasonable, but they're not static, right? Like maybe in one format, he does better than another, you know, there's a lot, but if you just take that as like a, a number, you know, Woody has two buys at, at GPs at this point. And, you know, you, that means that if we're talking about a limited GP, you start out two Oh, so that helps a lot. Right. And then in order to just to make it to day two, you know, you have to, you have to be, what is it? Uh, six, six and two. Yeah. Going into round eight. So, so yeah, of the six matches yeah, that I have to play, round eight. yeah, I got to win four of my six matches that I play. Right. So he needs to, you know, achieve a 66% win percentage just to make day two on average. Right. And then of course, that's not, that's not saying that you're going to win or do it. You know, that's just, yeah. just to scrape into day two, not even a result that you'd be particularly happy with. No, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's above the ex that's above your expectations for a given tournament. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and, and that's with you having a 62% win percentage at the sealed GPs or whatever is very high. Like that's good. You know, like that, 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 that is, I mean, sure. You know, we, we talked on the, or Ben and Huey talked on the podcast, last week about the ways that you can try to sneak in the extra two, three, four, maybe 5% with a lot of hard work. And, and you're trying to do that now. But I mean, when you really sit down and say, you know, on average, you should like barely make it to day two. You're like, oh, interesting, right? Like that means that like if I, but, but here's the really interesting part is that since these are such big chunks, the difference is like, if you win one extra match, right? Like you run hot or you just find the lines or you're dialed in or your deck's good or whatever it is. And you win one extra match. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you're into day two with an X one record, you know, and, and things are looking quite good. You win two extra matches and you're undefeated. And that's a huge difference at the tournament level. But if you lose one additional match, you're out. Yeah. Like you're not even making it to day two. Right. It's, you know? Yeah. The, the, it's funny, you know, uh, cause it was my, my girlfriend's first GP, you know, and I took a loss pretty early and, you know, I was like pretty bummed about it. And she's like, it's just one loss. And like, like explaining how much each individual match loss matters in those tournaments. It's really hard because right. you know? it looks like a big number, right? You're like, okay, well you're, you know, you have five wins and one yeah, loss. You're, you're four and one. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But each loss is just, I mean, you, you, you don't have that many nails in a coffin at a Grand Prix, you know. I mean, <laughs> the the first one you yeah. really start to your expectation of top eighting with the first loss like comes down. I would say like thirty, forty percent. You know what I mean? Uh, dramatically, yeah. yeah, huge, huge drop off. And you know, and and just for people that don't make it out to Grand Prix all that often, you know, you're going to end up playing fifteen rounds of Swiss. And to be safe, you need to be thirteen and two. Right. After that. Yeah. That that's where you you know basically know that you're gonna top eight in, in almost all circumstances. Thirteen and two. Now, even if you're getting the two buys, um, you know, by by earning those like Woody did, you know, you're still talking about an eleven and two record. And that is well, that's above yeah, anybody's expected win percentage. Yeah. You know, so H having top eighted yeah. one with like the one that I top aided, I, I only had one buy and I, I have to say, like, when you do it, it feels like something was broken. Like, it feels like, I mean, it, the, the performance that you put on is so insane, you know, like you just don't lose, you know, <laughs> you just win yeah. over and over and over again. And it just feels, it, it feels like this weird thing. Like you're not just playing a normal game anymore. So yeah. you just have to, yeah, that's the, it's, it's really, it's kind of hard to explain, but yeah, when you finally do spike it, it just, it felt like nobody else had a shot. You know, it's this weird feeling mm -hmm. where you're just, everything lines up and it just lines up more often based on that percentage. And that's the only thing that you can change. It's, it's, it's really, yeah. it's a weird thing. <laughs> Numbers are weird. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, what about uh, what about testing and stuff? You told us about what happens. You get your email yeah. for the flight and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I want you to talk us through. Um, you know, I want I want you to talk us through the whole experience. So you've got your email. You've kind of let the glow fade a little on and on your accomplishment. And now yeah. you're looking at like, oh, I actually have to go play against the best players in the world at the Pro Tour. Um, right. How, how do you, I mean, it's not like they just pull up a, a chair for you on a <laughs> professional testing team and no. say, welcome, you finally made it, Woodrow. You know, here's your seat. This is what we need you to do. Like, you're just kind of sitting there staring at your computer like, well, what now? Yeah, next up's panic for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 fir the first PT that I went to, I, I didn't, I just kind of didn't have a group, you know, I just decided, okay, well, yeah, me and you, me yeah, and you tested yeah, we, we, yeah, yeah, we talked and tested a little bit. Um, but we also couldn't do a lot of super relevant testing for a long time before the GP because the, the format was going to kind of change right at the last second. Um, like, uh, I believe it was, uh, not the one after shadows over Innistrad, uh, Eldritch moon, Eldritch moon was coming out. And it was going to come out about two weeks before the GP. And I was going to be traveling to Europe about a week before or a week before the PT. And uh, so my the timing was it was one of those things where it really pays to have a team in those situations because you're going to be able to source, you know, so many different deck ideas and, and kind of figure it out and broke it. And I think, uh, you know, one team did end up breaking it that year because it was such a small window of time when the set was going to be out. This time we had mm -hmm. more time and I decided that I didn't want to solo it because it didn't work out for me that well last time. And I was lucky mm -hmm. because a buddy of ours, Daniel Duterte, and uh, another friend of ours, Charles Wong, they both uh, – Daniel actually won the, the GP at Seattle, which was the, the GP where I won the PTQ, and Charles Wong top it. So I knew both of them were going to be going to the uh, Pro Tour. And uh, they had a little Facebook group put together with uh, – some Seattle people. There was also uh, Derek Jones was in there. Uh, Paul Blake was another person. And then uh, we, had, we got Kenji in there. Kenji mostly just sniped all our information. Uh, Spread it out to the other yeah. teams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, uh, you know, we started talking about things. We, you know, we spent the first couple of weeks talking about Dominaria when that first came out, evaluating specific cards and trying to get a handle on the format. Um, I felt like I, I got Dominaria pretty quickly, you know, like I was winning a lot of draft trophies on Magic Online. So pretty quickly, I, I I kept drafting throughout to make sure that it wasn't like sometimes you'll get skewed results at the beginning of a format because like nobody else gets it, you know, that type of thing. And then it'll even out mm -hmm. as time goes on. That happens a lot. So I, I, tried, I tried to make sure that that wasn't the case. Uh, it didn't seem to be moving forward. So I, I knew I needed to focus a lot of my time on standard because I'm not a super strong standard player, even though that's what got me to both my PTs. But <laughs> I don't know. I think I got lucky. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, so but these guys think about standard a lot more than I did. So we, you know, we discussed like, you know, we would take standard decks into the the leagues and and discuss. We were actually doing a lot of physical testing with each other, which that's getting more common. I mean, the speed at which you can jam games on Magic Online is just such an advantage that yeah. that the internal yeah. testing groups, unless you're doing internal drafts, um, which we weren't doing uh, for standard and stuff like that, it's just it's really tough to beat the speed. You, you're leaking a little bit of information, but you know it. The formats kind of get solved now. You know the standard format, so leaking mm -hmm. information is getting less and less important. I think as time goes on, but we. Um, yeah, we would just, you know, we discuss, we we all decided, most of us decided we were going to be playing blue white control. We really liked to ferry. Uh, it turned out not to <laughs> not to be the best choice cuz everybody was jamming aggro decks and we died very quickly, but um but you know, we we would go over, you know, sideboard cards, sideboard cards for the aggro decks and you know, like what uh you know, cyber cards for the mirror, and you know, we're all trying to figure out what percentage of each deck we're going to be seeing. Uh, that, that's that's the really important information to get the most right is what percentage of standard decks you're going to be seeing at the at the pro tour um i know this is like a limited but limited uh, focus podcast but a lot of your time when you make the pt is spent on trying to figure standard out because if you're a competent yeah. drafter you know you're gonna have to play six matches of draft you're only gonna have to draft twice and you know if you're crushing on moto and you have like five or six draft trophies, you're about as prepared as, as most people are going to be at the PT. Maybe not the top, top, you know, the top, top people are, you know, like having, a, they have actual Excel spreadsheets where they have each pick, you know, rated, you know, down to like the 10th decimal or whatever. And maybe they have that memorized. <laughs> maybe they don't, you know, who knows, but, 
Uh, but yeah, I think for the most part, your, your draft preparation is going to feel a lot like, you know, if you play a lot of magic online, it's just going to feel a lot like that. But standard is where uh -huh. it gets a little confusing. You know, you see the, the mm -hmm. pros, the pros are, you know, sometimes they're submitting their deck lists 20 out, you know, 20 hours before they're going to shuffle up and play them, you know, and they don't really know what they're going to do until they actually submit it. And a lot of that is probably them trying to guess what the metagame is going to be, you know, because that's the part yeah, that's definitely. very, very hard, you know, like all of those players have preferred archetypes that they like to play and ones that they're really good at. And if it, that was the case, if you could just get the best equity by, by playing the deck that you liked the best every time, they would just, they would submit like months ahead of time. But because they don't right. know what the metagame is going to be, that's why they're sweating it out to the very last second, you know, and second guessing themselves and then finally hitting the submit yeah. button and hoping. And, and trying to break it yeah, and all that too. Right. So yeah, that, that's kind of, that, that was my experience. You know, you just find people okay. that are competent, that, that are easy to talk to and, you know, are able to have disagreements without having it just turn into a giant fight, you know, and be able to explain their positions. That's the most important part. Like you, you don't want somebody that's just hyperbolic all the time. You, you want somebody, or even if they are hyperbolic, you want them to be able to go like, like Ben Stark's he's a hyperbolic guy. Like he says, everything's broken, but he can explain to you exactly mm -hmm. what he means if you ask him. Right. Like that's, yeah. And his teammates know to translate. Yeah, totally. You know, that, that that's just a, yeah. it's a quirk, right? It's not the limit of what they're able to convey, you know? So that's really important. Right. You just have to have people that are good communicators and care about the game and are competitive, you know? Okay. So. And then what happens when you actually go out? Like, uh, you know, uh, you, you've played in a bunch of GPs now uh -huh. in a bunch of local tournaments and stuff. I mean, is there a different vibe at the PT or is it just like, oh, this is like a smaller GP? Uh, yeah. What happens when you get there? You know, do you get free stuff? Like what happens? Yeah. You, yeah, you get, you get a big bag uh, initially with all your stuff in it. Uh, there's all these like funny little, little things that are just almost like jokes, you know, like you, you know, all the new players cause they're wearing their badges, you know, that, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Cause you get a badge that says that you're at the pro tour and, and uh, it's so true. I, I wore my badge at my first one. And then at my second one, I'm like, oh, yeah, we, you don't wear those. It's, <laughs> you know, now you're now you're a cool guy. Um, yeah. you, you get, you know, you get free products. The site is really cool compared to like a, a Grand Prix. It's set up very, very nice. There's a lot more space because there's less players. Um, and it's you just you feel like. At a Grand Prix, there's a lot of variance in the type of players. I mean, you got players that are just there because you know, they wanted to come and play commander, but they just decided that they would take a shot at the main event or, you know, they're there with a friend that they yeah. really play that much. And it's all over the place. It's this very, it's like a melting pot and you kind of, you can kind of mentally, you're just like, okay, well, I know I'm a serious player and I'm, I'm gauging whether or not the people that I'm seeing are serious players at the PT. Everybody is a serious player. You know, you know, a hundred percent that these are people that care mm -hmm. about the game and you feel it almost, uh, it's weird. Like there's like a nervousness that comes with that. And then also there isn't cause you're like, well, they know I'm a serious player too. Right. Like th there, mm -hmm. there are definitely, yeah. there's definitely a range at the, at the pro tour, you know, between like somebody like Kai and John Finkel and somebody who just like spiked their first PTQ or whatever. But you know that everybody there is thinking about this stuff. You know, nobody, nobody just completely, you know, like goes in on their, you know, they, they went to two F and M's and then they walk in and somehow spike the pro tour. That just doesn't really happen. Right. right. So, right. Yeah. It's just too hard to get on the PT that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then when it comes to actually playing the matches, uh, does that, does that feel any different or do you just get into magic and it's just magic? Well, it's professional REL, which is a little bit different than competitive REL. I mean, you, you really feel like you have a responsibility to play the game at a very clean, high level, you know I what see. I mean? And when mm -hmm. you make mistakes, like, you know, I made mistakes and, and had judges called on me, but you feel it more at the pro tour, you know, like it, it doesn't feel, um, I guess, you know, you, you feel like you really want to kind of tighten all the, the hatches up, you know, as you go, everybody's really good. I mean, the, the games end up being mechanically pretty sound because, you know, you're not dealing with the sort of, uh, you know, the confusion that comes from just like not knowing the rules at all. You know, everybody knows the rules very well and it feels like the games go pretty smoothly. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, you get paired up against some, some named people and, and how you're going to, you deal with that pressure that's tough you know like i let's see who did i play against i played against um 
uh, uh, Simon Nielsen. He's a really good player. Um, you know, oh, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and uh, you recognize these names, you know, like, and you're like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> this isn't going to be easy. You know, you, mm-hmm. you at the Grand Prix, you know, like you'll, you'll go down and you're like, well, hopefully I get somebody who isn't a, as serious about this as me so I can get a little bit of edge and, and you kind of, yeah. you just, when, at least on day one. Right. Yeah. yeah. At the PT, you're just, you're like, okay, well, everybody here is just going to cut my throat <laughs> if I let them. So we better, right. we better uh, yeah. definitely play tight. Well, and even somebody like you, who's dedicated, you know, a good amount of time and resources to getting better and, yeah. and practicing and stuff, you're still going to find people that are just full-time professional right. players, right? Yeah. They're just, they've been out there for two weeks grinding against other professional players in like a, in a testing environment that kind of thing too. Right. Um, do, you, do you enjoy it? Is it fun? Yeah. Do you like well, it? Do you I, want to do it again? I enjoyed the first day. <laughs> the second day I got food poisoning on, on the pro tour. So it was, uh, yeah. that part was less enjoyable. He was drafting with a bucket next to his table. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't it actually happened. It wasn't the best, <laughs> Pretty good. but, um, yeah. But you know, at least I day two. You know, I I I, I, spo- yeah. I suppose like. But I mean, in general, yeah. too. I just you know, like, do, do you like playing on the pro? I do like. I mean, it. I yeah. There, there's you know, there's room in these things for like I put all this weight on it, and I got there, and it was fine, right? I, I but but also it can be like this is everything I want to do in my life. You know, I don't. I, I want to get your take on that. Right? Like, is it just magic? Is it okay? Or is it like I want to be part of this type of thing? Definitely. Yeah. I, I every time I go, I want to go back and I want to do better than the last time I did. I mean, obviously my sample size is small. I've only got two, but you know, like getting to attend any tournament where not anybody can go sign up, it just has this feeling to it. You know, like it's got this, wow, like yeah. I'm in some kind of, uh, I don't know what the word is. It's just like this club, you know, like that, that, mm-hmm. you yeah, know, it's exclusive yeah, thing. And yeah. It's a, uh, you know, there's like a little bit of a pedi- pedigree that comes with it. And it's just, it's just a really neat feeling. You know, there's not a lot of, you know, I'm, I just turned 35 today, you know, and, uh, Happy birthday, Wood. Yeah, just, you know, trying to get it in there. <laughs> but no, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, you know, at 35, you don't have a lot of opportunities to play something at a higher level as, you know, playing Magic on the Pro Tour. Like, I'm not going to, you know, I, right. I missed my NBA window, you know. So, <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, like, and the fact that you get to do that, I mean, it's it's really it's neat. You know, I mean, I, I can't think of anything else. It really is. I can't think it's of anything else thing. that I could start right now where I would be at the, you know, top or second to the top, you know, level of competition. You know, it's, it'd be really tough. Right. If you picked any other random right. thing, whether it was an intellectual pursuit like chess or, you know, poker or, you know, long distance running, I mean, whatever you did to get to the top level of competition, I mean, it would just be so hard, you know, and, I've got this one thing Mm -hmm. that I I got to do, you know, it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It is special. All right. Wood. thanks so much uh, for coming on and sharing your story with us. I hope hopefully it was uh, useful for our listeners who find themselves, you know, in the same range that you're in, like maybe they've qualified or they're close or they started to day two their GPs, but haven't quite hit one yet. Um, You know, doing well at the PTQ scene, but just haven't, you know, one short of that RPTQ finish, that type of thing. But uh, I wanted to, to show people what it was like kind of uh, on the other for side. Sure. So thanks for coming on. What was thanks. great stuff. If there's one takeaway and this is something that Marsh has mm-hmm. told me a lot, like, uh, or, or at least he's yeah, conveyed this is if you feel like you're knocking on the door often and, but it feels like you're not getting there, you'll get there eventually. And you'll feel yeah. silly for having doubted it. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. all of a sudden you're just like, Oh, well, I just finally flipped enough coins with my percentage, uh, advantage. And it, it just happened for me. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen that so many times uh, from my position, both in poker, but mainly in magic as a commentator and watching players who I knew were good enough and just hadn't, you know, Kenji's a great example of this as well. You know, I'm, he had six winning ends right. and he bricked on all of them. And I'm just like, this is just ridiculous. Like this kid can absolutely play. He's better than most of the people out here. Right. He's definitely a pro tour level player. And I'm just like, as long as he doesn't just give up, he will absolutely make it. And he did. You know, he played in the same pro tour. Uh, that was his first pro tour, the one that you played right. as your second as well. Cool. All right, Wood. Yeah. Well, good luck. And, uh, of course, people can keep up with, with Woody uh, on the vlogs and on Twitter. Uh, what's your what's your Twitter, Twitter handle, Wood? It's at Woodrodius, which uh, <laughs> maybe I should shorten it. Uh, W-O-D-R-O-D-I-U-S is how you spell that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Woody will often um, put up 
his results and stuff as he goes through the tournaments. And again, you can find him on uh, my vlogs on the MTG Breakdown YouTube channel as well. I, I always uh, try to track down uh, Woody's results in between rounds and, and see what he's got going on there. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to kick Woody loose. And uh, I've opened up um, the Patreon for questions for me specifically. And I've got a whole bunch of them. And I'm going to go through basically everyone. Uh, I, I'm going to try to answer everyone the best that I can. So uh, let's sort of that right now. All right. Thanks so much to Woody for joining me now. I'm going to be answering questions that were directed towards me specifically, and I'm going to be doing that by myself, just, just me and you. So let's get into that. First one comes from William who says, what learning resources did you use when learning about audio and video production uh, in a YouTube tutorial series, books, freeware, that kind of thing? And then uh, what's one thing I wish I knew when I was first getting into digital media production? These are really good questions. Um, learning resources. Uh, I'm mainly self-taught for all of my stuff, but, uh, I did take a class, uh, well, like an online course. There's a, there's a website called lynda.com and they do all different types of tutorials for basically anything like, not just video and audio, but real life stuff, uh, you know, how to be an accountant or I want to be a, a painter or whatever. And they'll show you uh, different levels of that. And I took a, a course um, from a woman named uh, Ashley Kennedy, who was fantastic. It was about 15 hours, I think it was a lot, um, but it was really good and gave me just like a good baseline on how the program works and what, what to care about for that kind of stuff. Uh, also on YouTube, a lot of different resources, but one that I've used a lot is a, a channel called Premiere Gal. And she uh, does tutorials and information and stuff about how to use Adobe Premiere, which is what I use. When I first started doing the podcast for audio, I used a program called GarageBand. That's uh, an Apple program that comes with every Mac. And I work on Mac. So I use that because it was free. And we were just starting the show. After a while, when we actually got like a sponsorship for the show, and I felt like, you know, I could put some of that money into trying to level up the show uh production and stuff like that. I went over to a program called Adobe uh, Audition, which is a, uh, which is an audio editing program. And uh, I use that still. Um, I also use mostly Adobe products for all of the stuff I do, uh, mainly just because they have a package called the creative cloud that you can get and you can pay a monthly fee which is kind of a pain, but whatever, uh, you get all access to basically all the programs. So it's, it's definitely worth it. And so that's something that I, that I, uh, I've used and put a lot of effort in on finding out what's one thing I wish I knew when I was first getting into digital media production. Well, one thing that, that I remember is, uh, to trust myself, like my instinct uh, early on was that the audio quality of the podcast was going to be really important and that we wanted to make sure that we put some effort and time into getting something set up that would give us audio that we thought was acceptable. And it turns out a lot of the podcasts, uh, especially the early magic podcast just didn't do that. And they just lost listeners. Cause it's like, if you can't understand what the person's saying, you're just not going to listen. I, I don't, I, if, if I downloaded a podcast and I couldn't hear the people, I'm just like, I, I'm just off it. There's way too many good options out there to try to slog through, you know, bad audio. So that was one thing. Um, the rest of it, I don't know. There, there really isn't any like silver bullet for it. I just had to learn it all slowly and kind of build up my skill set for it. Um, doing learning video was much harder because you can do kind of the basics on audio and get away with it pretty well. And then if you want, you can refine it down further. But, um, I, I guess the one thing that I wish I knew is that like how much was actually possible. You can actually do a lot more when it comes to editing and stuff that I originally thought, like you can change around words and take stuff out that you didn't think you could. Thank you, William. Next one comes from uh, Christian, who says, uh, I think no mailbag episode is complete without food questions. You are correct, Christian. So what's your favorite food question ever asked? And to be more magic related, what are you eating when playing a tournament without dedicated lunch break? Um, my favorite food question? I don't know. I I can't even think of any of the questions offhand. Um that we've been asked, but we have been asked many of them. I'll, I'll tell you what, Christian, your, yours is my favorite food question. Congratulations. And, uh, uh, for, as far as tournaments go, um, I actually bring these by the way to tournaments. I'm not even just playing, uh, even when I'm working and stuff is that I'm a big proponent of healthy snacks because I find that like when I'm at home and I'm, you know, maybe I'll be working on stuff for the, for the websites and that kind of stuff, you know, uh, 
I can eat pretty normal meals and be okay and, you know, have a snack here or there. But when I'm working, when I'm in the booth or playing in a tournament, I feel like I get way hungrier, way more often than I normally would. And I'm the type of person that if I haven't eaten my, I don't function well, like my brain just misfires and I can't think straight. And the things that the words that are trying to, I'm trying to summon to my mouth don't, you know, don't quite make it there. That kind of thing happens all the time. So I'll bring things like dried pineapple, dried mango, um, dried, uh, or, or roasted, um, pumpkin seeds. Is that what they are? Yeah, I think that's what they are. I love those things. Um, big fan of pistachios. Uh, I, that's my favorite kind of my go-to snack. So I'll bring a bunch of those and, uh, and then, you know, I'll try to try to scrape up a sandwich or something like that when I can. Uh, Michael says M19 uh, mist collar seems way above my head. Is this rare card a game saver in this set? Um, don't actually know what that card does, so I'll just look it up right now. Let's see here. Mist collar. Let's see. Blue mana, 1-1 one, one rare merfolk wizard. Activated ability. Sacrifice it. Until end of turn, if a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast, exile it instead. Uh, no, this is like a sideboard card for constructed against things like... Um, like reanimator strategies or cheating creatures into play or something that looks like, uh, not a game saver. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be good and limited. Um, next one comes from Johannes who says, hello, Marshall. During your coverage stream, you mentioned that you speak German and made several trips to Germany in the past. What is the background of this connection with the country? And when will you visit the lovely city of Münster for a quick draft? Also, ich kann auf Deutsch, uh, wenn du willst, Johannes. Um, ich bin in Deutschland sechsmal gewesen und ich hatte einen Freund hier uh, in High School und er ist ein Deutscher und ich habe ihn besucht in, wann ich 19 Jahre alt oder sowas. Und um, ja, was weiß ich? Uh, <coughs> ich liebe Deutschland. Uh, ich habe viel Spaß gehabt und ja. Uh, yeah. That's it. I go there whenever I can. Unfortunately, we don't have magic tournaments there. I've switched back to English for the, the greater uh, <laughs> listening audience. But yeah, I, I don't uh, I'd love to go to Germany more, but we just can't uh, hold magic tournaments there. So I don't I don't really get to uh, to speak my German much. And, and boy, it does feel rusty speaking it because I don't get to speak it that often. Only to a few of the to the German magic players. But um, yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Johannes and yeah, ich würde gerne draften mit dir einen Tag. Uh, Tobias, maybe another German, Tobias Sterling or Toby, Toby Sterling uh, says, Hey, Marshall, here's my question. Uh, do you maintain a paper magic collection? Why or why not? Um, and then what's the sickest collection I ever saw? Keep up the good work, man. You bring a level of professional in what you do. That is unprecedented. It should be. Thank you very much, Tobias. I really appreciate that uh, last sentiment. I do not maintain a paper MTG collection at this point. I did for quite a while, especially when I was playing more often. But I decided that it was too much. The thing is, I actually don't like collections. Um, I like owning things that I can use. So like when I was regularly PTQing, especially with constructed, I did maintain a collection because I needed those cards, but I don't actually like owning things just for the sake of owning them. I like, I like it if I get to use the things that, that, that works for me, but what doesn't is just look at the things that I have, but they don't do, or they don't add anything to my life. I just have them in some binder in some room and they're there and that's it. Uh, so I decided to sell most of my collection a few years ago to kind of downsize and not own quite as many things. Uh, like I said, especially stuff that I am not using. As some of you know, like I do, like I, I, I'm a big watch person. I like uh, vintage watches or something that I'm, uh, is a hobby of mine and I have a lot of them. Um, but the ones that I don't wear, I get rid of, I sell or trade or, or, or move out. Um, because I, I just don't like the idea of just owning things for the sake of it. It just doesn't sit well with me. I feel like you carry kind of this weight with you, with your possessions. And, and I don't like that. 
Um, the sickest collection I've ever seen. I've seen some completely absurd collections. Uh, one from a former Wizards of the Coast employee who had all types of beta stuff, a hundred mocks and plus like all this crazy, like, uh, uh, prototype stuff that you just can't get. That was insane. Another one I saw was completely absurd. Um, I went into a local card store maybe three or four years ago and they had all these sick cards laid out on the counter. I'm like, what is going on here? And they had told me that they had, they had that dream purchase, that dream sale came in where some guy came in off the street, kind of an older dude. And he said, I want to sell my magic cards. I said, sure, let's see what you got. And he pulled out a, a card box and a binder and the binder had all alpha and beta mint pack fresh stuff. And they're just like, what? And he said, I was into this when it first came out, but I didn't learn how to play. And I just, you know, liked the cards and the pictures. And I was kind of like a baseball card collector. So I collected a bunch of them and put them in binders and stuff. And so they're just perfectly mint cards. He had opened up a bunch of packs. He was an adult at the time. So he actually had money to, to you know, spend a few hundred bucks on some magic cards when that was an unheard of thing to do. And the shop is like, this is unbelievable. So they made a deal with him. And I, and I got to see some of it and it was crazy because one of the things I was like, do you have any basics? And they're like, oh yeah. And they pulled out these piles of basic lands because I had had a bunch from when I played back in the day, but I was wanted to use them for my draft lands because they were my favorite artwork for lands. And I, I like to bring my own lands to draft so I don't have to do the whole like digging around and making sure they get their lands, but I just get to have my, my lands. And they were, I was like, this is awesome because I wanted certain pictures, right? Like I like the Island. that's like the blue one with the green Island on it. And I was like, well, do you have any of these? And they're like, sure, just go through this pile. And I'm going through and I find, you know, 20 or 30 of them. And I'm just like, this is great. I'm just going to drop some money here, but I'm going to have these forever. And I'm just going to do it. And on top of it, I don't know if they were like maybe a little <laughs> punch drunk from the purchase, but I'm like, well, how much for these? And they, they were like, man, four bucks each or whatever. And you know, at the time they were worth like six or seven. And since I'm buying, I bought, you know, 50 of them or 60 or I, I can't remember how many I ended up getting. I wanted to fill out all the rest of the ones that I didn't have. You know, I just, I bought them all. But you know, when you're saving two or three bucks per card, it adds up really quick. You know, if, and we're talking a couple of hundred bucks, you know, uh, that I would save off of that. And I, still have them. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Uh, Kyle Wells says, tell us about nubs. Nubs is actually sitting right next to me right now. That's nubbin. She's, she's the cat uh, that you see in the vlogs sometimes. And uh, she is the best cat ever. That's all you need to know about nubs. Um, Shane Garvey says, G'day, Marshall. What is your number one tip for drafting, drafting vintage cube? My number one tip is do not play fair. Don't try to be the person at the table who says, you know, I'm just going to draft some creatures and maybe some equipment and a removal spell and we'll see what happens. Don't do that. Aim for the stars. Pick the cards in the opening packs that have the highest upside and try your hardest to make those work. That's how you crush people at vintage cube. Next question, question comes from Luke who says, after spending years listening uh, to you for an hour a week, you guys have become something more than quiet little voices on the other end of my earbuds. That's a little reference from Luke. I get it, Luke, and I love it. Um, he says, I'm not sure I'm alone in that feeling, uh, in feeling a false sense of familiarity or friendship um, when, in fact, you don't even know me from Adam. And by the way, that's another reference. Luke is kind of lighting it up. He says, um, that leads to my question. What is the preferred level of interaction with listeners when you are covering an event? The times I've been at a Grand Prix you're covering, I've come over and said hi, but my friends seemed a little more sheepish, like they didn't want to bother you. Is it a pain uh, having to glad hand a bunch of random strangers between rounds? Where's the line uh, where on where fan interaction becomes a hassle? Thanks for the great show. Luke, great question. Um, it's an interesting one for me because... Uh, there's a lot of different types of personalities, uh, in the world and some of them really feed off of attention and the, the feeling like they're famous or important or liked. And I have to say it's a little bit unfortunate for me because I'm not one of those people. Um, I just don't get a big rush off of any of those things. Really. I'm more of a private person. I'm actually, I, i say this to people and they probably don't believe it, but I'm actually can be very shy. I, I don't openly approach people. I don't like calling people I don't know on the phone. Like I'm weird like that. And once, once I know you, then I'm, I'm good to go. And I can put on that 
side of my personality that's more out there, like when I'm in the booth and stuff like that. Um, but meeting people is hard. Like it's, it's, it's a thing that is, I don't, you know, you're a stranger. I don't really know like where you stand or what you think about me or what, you know, and, and I don't have that personality that just thinks, oh, I'm great. Of course you want to talk to me. That's just not how I roll. So it took me a little while to adjust to, to talking to people at GPs. The good news is super got used to it and I really enjoy it now. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I'm really lucky because a lot of people that do podcasts like the one that we do, they do them from home and or from a studio and they don't actually get to meet in face to face their listeners very often. Like maybe once a year, they'll bump into somebody on the street or something like that. But I do because one of my other jobs happens to be doing coverage and I'm surrounded by my listeners at these events. I actually get to interact with and talk to my listeners on a regular basis. And it is fantastic. It is it's inspirational. It's touching. Um, I appreciate every interaction I get with every person. I told myself if I was ever in a position to talk to people in this way, that I would make sure that I made, that they knew that I cared about that and that I listened to them. And, you know, I set the bar pretty high for myself on that way because I've met people that I admired before or whose work I really liked and they were fine, but just a little standoffish and a little like, yeah, okay, here you go. See you later. You know? And I thought, I'm never going to do that if I'm ever in that position. And now I am and I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I take it seriously that, you know, you're taking your time to come over and chat with me and, uh, and I really like it. Um, I don't really have a line. I mean, I've given people hugs. I've signed a potato. Um, I've had people give me stuff. Uh, that was another one, by the way, that was hard for me at the beginning was I would not accept things like people would say, Oh, here, I want to give you this, 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 you know, just as a way to say thank you for the show. And I'd be like, oh, you're good, man. Like I, I do the show for these reasons. Like you don't need to, to give me something. But, you know, after a while, I was kind of hammered into my head. Look, you, you're being rude, not accepting that. Like that person took that and brought that for you and they were excited to give it to you. And you say no is like way worse than, you know, anything else. And And I was like, wow, that is totally true. Like if I had put together something for somebody and I would want them to be like, that is awesome. Thank you. You know, and not to be like above it and say like, Oh, you don't need to do that. And, and, and here you go. You're going to keep this thing. So I stopped doing that. And, it, and th that was completely correct. I, even if I'm like a little weird about it, it's like, don't show that just, just take the thing. So Luke, pretty much anything goes. I I'm, I like talking to people now, so I'm, I'm good with it. Daniel says, I'd love to hear your opinions on MTG Arena. How does it compare to Magic Online? What do you see for the future of the two programs? What is your opinion on the quick draft version? Uh, competitive draft. What tips would I have? Okay, so lots of questions here. Uh, he says, quick aside, I drafted at a shop I've never been in this week, and I sat down with my LR deck box from the Kickstarter years ago. That's awesome, Daniel. One guy said, uh-oh, watch out for this guy. He's a drafter and pointed my deck box just to show how uh, great the reputation of your show is and how much influence it has. Thanks, Daniel. That's great. Um, talking about MTG Arena, I'm excited for it. I genuinely am. Uh, I know a lot of people think that like I have to say certain things because I have a working relationship with Wizards of the Coast as a as a contractor uh, for for commentary, but I really don't. Um, you know, I, I look. I'm not stupid, right? I'm not that I'm not going to go on social media and just start bashing Wizards of the Coast for no reason, you know, just because I feel like it like that would be a thing where they'd say, look, you're, you know, you're spouting off on these things. And, you know, you're also sitting here representing it. But the thing is, I get a view on some of this stuff at Wizards of the Coast that a lot of people don't like the employees and the decisions and the you know, background stuff. And I don't, I don't have full access or anything, but I get to see a little more than your average magic fan, which is what I consider myself. And I actually think that by and large, they do quite a good job given the circumstances that they're in and the constraints that they face. It's, it's getting things done like this is extremely hard. And when it comes to arena, I think that this is what we need. Like, I think that the, the lack of, of a great digital option has been a major worry point uh, for our game and for Wizards of the Coast for years. Uh, I've always looked at it like, hey, this step needs to happen. They need to move into a digital realm that can compete with the new things that are popping up. And they had a long time where they didn't really have competition, and they do now. You know, games like Hearthstone and stuff, you know, the, these are real games that are sticking around and that people love. And, you know, Magic, I think, has 
finally said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to take this big push. And it's a big job and it's a big risk because if this flops, where are they now? Right. Uh, It's a big deal. So, and the good news is, is that every time I've played it, I've been like, this is not only pretty good, but improving quickly. Uh, You know, they've, they're putting a ton of work in on it. I think it looks gorgeous. Um, I think the gameplay is fine. Like it takes a little while to get used to if you're used to Magic Online, but God forbid you remember the first time you played Magic Online. That was hard too. So it's just one of those things that I, I think that, you know, we need to give it the time to come around, but I think it's a very necessary and a very important step uh, into the future. And I'm really glad to see that they're making it. I honestly don't see that they have a choice anyway. Like <laughs> they have to do something. And Magic is such a difficult game to translate into digital. We'll just have to see. Uh, if they can do it, but I, I like the direction it's going. Next a question comes from Josiah, who says, Hi, Marshall. First, I just wanted to say thanks for everything you've done on the podcast. You are welcome. Uh, I've done really well in drafts and sealed since I started listening. My question has to do with art. Who's your favorite artist or, and art from the game? Ooh, that's a great. I love that. Um, my traditional favorite artist is Mark Tadeen. Uh, he was active during, you know, the very beginning of the game and all the way through. In fact, he still uh, is, you know, does some cards here and there. Uh, but, you know, my my old school favorite card uh, was uh, Time Vault. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have a beta Time Vault that I've had for a little while now. Um, that's kind of a card like that's my magic collection. <laughs> I mentioned earlier how I don't like to just own a whole bunch of stuff, but I do have a few specific cards that were gifts to me or, or special cards to me that I have. And that kind of replaced that for me. Uh, and that's one of them, uh, modern day, the artwork is so good across the board, but the people that I tend to go back to over and over are people like Noah Bradley, his artwork always stands out to me on every card. I'm always just like, I have this weird thing where every set review, I just look at the card and I go, God, that artwork's sick. And I just think it's got to be Noah. And I look down, it's like, yep, it's Noah. And maybe I just have a feel for his style now, but like, I love his stuff. Um, and Titus Lunter as well is another one that I'm consistently impressed by. And, and I like uh, the way that he, he does his stuff. Um, my favorite art ever is the uh portal man of war uh it's my favorite card but that's that artwork also stands out as one of those early examples of early magic card artwork that was weird and different and that would never fly today you know it's this it th- the thing it reminded me of is like an old textbook or something where it has this man of war jellyfish like dragging off this great white shark and it looked like some type of diagram from like a crappy textbook from when i was a kid or something like that and uh and i am lucky enough to have tracked down that actual painting from the artist, which is my other favorite artist, uh, artist, uh, Una Fricker, uh, going again, back to the old school. She did tons of, of animal based, uh, stuff and some, she did wasteland, a ton of stuff. If you look up her name, she's definitely in my, my hall of fame for art as well. And, uh, I was lucky enough to, to track down and purchase the actual painting and have that behind me too. I feel really lucky to have found that. And, uh, my friend, Josh, uh, help me do that as well. So thanks, Josh. Um, Jonathan asks, who's your favorite deck builder in Magic and why is it Shota Yasuoka? <laughs> uh, Shota is definitely on my list. He's He builds some of the coolest control decks out there, and I love that. Um, you know, I'm going to go actually off the grid a little bit here, and my, my answer is probably going to surprise you. One of my favorite deck builders is actually Ben Stark. And I know you think, well, he's a limited player, right? And yeah, he is, but he also plays constructed. And what Ben does uh, is he's a really great sort of tuning innovator. Like what he'll do is he'll take a deck late in a format when he really understands all the moving parts about what's out there. And he'll make sort of major but subtle tweaks to a deck. I'm not talking about like, oh, I've got the sideboard plan. I mean, he will say like, you know what, this green black deck with these tireless trackers or whatever uh, really is is where I want to be. And he'll take it to a GP and do well with it. He's done that multiple times that I've seen. And I'm always impressed by his takes on these because he's so not known for that. Um, but he's, he's sort of low key, a really good deck tuner slash builder when the conditions are right. So that, that's my guy there. Next one comes from Tristan who says, how many hours a week would you say you play magic? Hmm. How many hours? I don't know how many hours, but I would say I do. I would say I probably sit down on magic online to, to play 
uh, or, or in real life against somebody probably four to five times a week. And each one of those sessions is probably between one and six hours, like depending on if I'm just going to draft away forever or if I'm going to go play a tournament or something like that. Um, so probably 10 to 15 hours a week or maybe I'm totally guessing. And it does depend a lot on whether I'm traveling or tournament prep or what I've got going on with content, but I play a lot. Like I still love playing. I play basically any time. Like it's my relaxation time. Like I don't watch uh, TV really ever. And uh, I, I watch movies on airplanes basically exclusively. So if I'm at home and I'm not working and I'm not away from a computer, I'm probably drafting. I, I love it. I, I, it, I find it really important to keep that passion alive too, because I don't think I could do the jobs that I do unless I really got into it. I think there's a temptation to kind of move away from those things and just like focus on broadcasting or editing and stuff. But I'm like, no, I have to make sure that I'm in the trenches and I'm playing as much or more magic, you know, than, than most people. Next question comes from Morgan who says during a recent GP, two multiple GP winning high ranking pros made errors during a game in our matches. Errors felt felt little more than ha like a haphazard mistake. I called a judge in both instances and in both times the player was issued a game rule violation. After my round, I recounted the tale of the game to my friends. All of them felt the mistakes in both instances were an intentional attempt to cheat. They say I should have appealed the rulings to a head judge and describe how I felt that the, that they were intentional actions. I'm not really one to create a big scene or go after one of these guys, but on the other hand, I'm giving a, a, a hand in letting this behavior continue. Do these guys angle shoot and go until they get caught? How would I, how should I have handled this? Morgan, this is a broad topic and one that I'm glad you brought up. I think you handled it perfectly, to be honest. Um, as long as you call the judge, when you see anything from anybody, I don't care who it is. Uh, and let them know exactly what happened in a concise and truthful manner. In my opinion, it is up to the judges to spot these patterns and to to do an investigation if they think that something was cheating. Now, if you told the judge everything that needed to be told and the judge came to that conclusion, I would stick with it. If you feel like the judge misinterpreted what you said uh, or was charitable in their interpretation of what you were saying and you needed to clarify further that your specifics here were more important than the judges may be giving it credit for, then I would do that. I would pull the judge aside and I would say, look, I wasn't bringing you over here because I thought that my opponent made a mistake. I was bringing you over here because I believe what they did was intentional. And here's why I think that now you have to have something pretty strong. You, it, you know, a lot of these type of angle shot type things can look like a mistake and they weren't. So they may not go along with you still. But if you do feel strongly and you have some type of reasoning that you can explain to a judge, then tell them that. And then again, it is up to the judge ultimately to decide how they want to do it. But remember, just getting a GRV or a warning, you know, these things add up and you are doing your part, Morgan, um, by by making that call. So I think you did the right thing. Uh Austin says, hey, Marshall, longtime listener, started a little while ago. Love the show. Uh, I'm in the midst of planning a cube with custom cards. The possibilities are overwhelming. If you could design a custom card cube, what would you make sure to include? Uh, a specific archetype or combo, that kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, I've never designed a cube from scratch myself. I've helped people do it, so I have some experience with it. But I've certainly never done one with custom cards. Um you know, custom cards, by the way, Austin means he's going to design his own cards to go in the cube. One of the coolest ones I ever heard of was a split card cube where every single card in it was a split card. And they did some really interesting stuff with that. Um, cards that can be cast from the graveyard, but want to be cast from your hand, like a sorcery that does something. And then when it's in the graveyard, it does something else because sorceries end up in the graveyard. I thought that was really cool. Um, look, my favorite types of cubes tend to be the more like limited focused ones where you're, you're sort of rewarded for certain types of thing or the really crazy ones, like the ones like the vintage cube where you're just going completely nuts. You have such a blank slate, Austin. I would try to focus in on one type of thing um, that you wanted to explore rather than just having it be uh, open-ended. Cause I think you're just never going to finish it. It's just like, 
it's just too much to try to design a, an open-ended set. You know, Mark Rosewater always preaches that restrictions uh, breed creativity, and I think he's right, and I think you should take that to heart here for your custom cube and really try to focus on something, whether artifacts or tribal or whatever it is that you – it's the aggro cube or whatever it is that you want to do, but but have some restrictions because, boy, I, I, I wouldn't even want to face down that decision either uh, on where do we go from here. Next comes from James. He says, there's a topic that might make a good MTG breakdown, uh, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it. We all know Magic Online for its strengths, um, for all its strengths, has bugs and some UI issues. When bugs or obvious misclicks happen that negatively affect your opponent, I think most MTGO players typically feel bad for them, but still take full advantage even if it's easy way to mitigate it. For example, if my opponent F6s through their whole turn, it would seem simple and fair to me to just skip mine as well and pass it back until, but until recently, it's not something I'd even considered. In Dominaria match recently, I accidentally used Icy to tap my opponent's short sword instead of the creature it was on, and they went ahead and swung in. Why is it that in paper magic, no one would say, oh, you pointed slightly to the left of uh, my creature, so you must have wanted to tap the equipment, but online, the majority of players, including myself, take full advantage by default. Great question, James. Um, and this is the case, by the way, and I know the reasoning why. It, the reasoning why is because magic online is is ruthless. Like, if you click on a certain pixel, <laughs> whatever that pixel is attached to is what's going to get clicked. And that's, that's on you. You have to be careful about how you click and the way that you use buttons like F6, even if it was clearly a mistake, where in real life, you can verbalize you th there's gray area in, ver in real life where there is none on magic online. And the reason why people don't feel compelled to, uh, you know, give you a break in those situations is twofold. The first one is pretty straightforward. It's that using the UI is part of this skill set of being a magic online player. And I know that that sounds weird because you might think, but, but it's about the magic cards and the strategy with magic, but it's not. It's also about things like clock management, right? Uh, you know, think of magic as a much bigger game than just attacking and blocking with creatures. Let's say you decide not to bring snacks to a GP and then you get grumpy because, you know, you haven't eaten in a long time and then you, your brain short circuits on you and then you make a mistake and now you're angry because you, you know, you played worse because because you didn't bring a banana and your opponent did, right? And so th it covers a bigger spectrum of things that lead to victories at Magic rather than just strategic decisions. And in Magic Online, that is things like misclicking and reducing that down as much as possible. So that's the first reason. The other reason is, is that there is a precedent set that sort of says you don't have to do that. You shouldn't. It's a game. It's a zero sum game. And what's going to happen is, is if you start doing that, you might feel good about yourself and you might even think it's the right thing to do. And that's fine. You know, do you, but your opponents won't. And everybody misclicks on magic online from time to time. And if there's an inconsistent application of how people handle it, meaning some people let you off the hook, but some don't. Anybody who says that they don't is just getting the better of the whole system. So it's better from a game theory standpoint to say, well, everybody just says that we won't because then everybody's on an even playing field and that's it. So watch those misclicks, James. Ira says, in an old mailbag show with Brian Wong, someone asked what well, your invitational card would be. You said you need more time to think about it. Well, check your calendar. Today is Reckoning Day. What super cool custom card would you create to represent yourself? Oh, no. I get put right back on the spot because uh, that's a really hard question, and I'm not really much of a, of a card designer. Um, I would certainly have it be include my favorite type of interaction, which is a tempo play of some sort. So something is going to get returned to hand. Um, how about this? The card I want is one in a blue, one, one flying. This is off the top of my head. Uh, and it's remand. So when it enters the battlefield, I can return target spell to its owner's hand, but I don't get to draw the card. Instead, I just get the one, one flyer. That's my, that's my, that, that's, that's the card, uh, Ira. So you got me, but I came up with something on the fly. So haha. -ha. Matthew says, Hey, Marshall, I have a theory I want to run by you. In most draft formats, high level players often disagree on the optimal strategies, picks, etc. Usually these players can point to a high win percentage as evidence of their viewpoints. I'm wondering if a lot of the disagreement is simply a function of good players playing well, regardless of whether the strategy they developed is optimal or not. Put another way, a great player with a reasonable take on a format will get results similar similar to another great player with a somewhat better take on the format. Well, it's hard to say. Um, gameplay 
stra- you know, gameplay ability does affect strongly your, your win rate. You could draft a really good deck, but if you're just terrible at playing the games, your win rate's not going to be good. Uh, if the players are of equal skill and there's a reasonable sample size, then you certainly could point to their draft ability as the difference. But the truth is, is that this is all way too small a sample size and way too varied. Uh, each player, uh, it, you know, is going to be on some level of similar play skill, but I've seen pros argue it out forever and they're both Hall of Famers. So you just don't know where that's going to stand. Your theory absolutely could be the truth, but the other truth is we won't know. We won't be able to figure that out because there's just no way to put like a strong number on somebody on any given moment about how good they are uh, at the game. And so therefore you cannot isolate that variable reasonably. So Chris says, when did you start playing and why did you ever take a break from the game? Have you ever owned any power? Lastly, my all time favorite set, Uh, LR episode notifications are some of my favorite emails to see in the inbox. Thanks again for my favorite podcast. You're welcome, Chris. Thanks for that. Uh, I started playing, uh, when I was like either in high school or just out of high school. Um, and I started playing because my best friend at the time, Jay played, uh, and uh, I wanted to play as well. Uh, I was terrible. All I did was build horrendous snake basket decks and, uh, yeah, I didn't play in any tournaments. Um, did I ever take a break from the game? Yes. I played for probably a year or so during that time and then kind of put the cards away. Um, and then I didn't play for like 10 years at least or something like that. And then, uh, I came back when Ryan coerced me back and showed me what limited was. Um, have I owned any power? Yes, I have owned power. Uh, I owned a, uh, Mox Emerald and I sold it on eBay in like, the year 2000 or something. So not, not, not my finest moment. My favorite all time, my all time favorite set is probably Innistrad. Uh, it's the one that's produced the most fun limited environment. Um, but I like a lot of other ones. Uh, uh, alpha is on the list. Arabian nights is on the list. Um, conflux is on the list. M 13. These are some of my favorite sets. Thanks for the quick question, Chris. We are cruising right through here. Uh, next one is from Alexander, who says, Hey, Marshall, great job on last week's show. My question is, have you recently identified any leaks in your limited game? If so, what are they and how did you uncover them? Absolutely. Uh, I have a pretty good feel for my archetype, my makeup now um, as a player. Um, a few of my more noticeable leaks to myself are... Uh, general sloppiness. Uh, I will still occasionally just make oversight mistakes. Um, and these aren't the ones that worry me super much, but still like I need to just tighten up and, and make those decisions a little more cleanly. Um, sometimes, uh, another, another big, uh, issue that I have that I've struggled with is, uh, not asking myself the right questions in the moment. Basically, I feel like if posed the questions that are relevant, I will make good answers, generally speaking. But occasionally, I don't fully process through those questions. And I kind of take the line of play that's the one that's intuitive to me. But if I stopped time, and I just asked myself, now, hold on a second, what's important here? And why are you doing you play you make isn't this other play better? I would be like, yes, it is better. And here's the reasons why and then I would go do that play instead. But sometimes I will stick with my my gut or the the line of play that I was on at that point too much. And then the other one is um, I fall for a pretty classic uh, way to, to spew off some equity, which is that I get looser when I'm way ahead. When I'm 90 something percent to win, I'm just like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. It'll work out. But, you know, I'll sometimes give myself my excuse me, my opponents a chance to have that you know, two or three cards in a row that can get them back in the game. And even if that only comes up one or two times out of a hundred, like there's no reason for it. I could easily just take the time to slow down and make sure that I'm doing every possible thing I could to shut the door on the game. And sometimes I don't. So those are the things that I've been working on the most. Um, the, the main one is that asking the questions thing. And so I've started doing something a little bit weird, but I've started to actually verbalize. I came from the world of poker where you never talk about what you're doing in the hand. And I took that to magic and I speak very little when I'm actually playing a match of magic. Um, but I've found that if I do verbalize, it actually helps me and I'm not proud of that, but it does, it does. And so I've started to do that a little bit more. Um, 
This next one comes from Tony, who says, Hi, Marshall. Uh, what have been your best moments as a player in Magic Poker Basketball or anything else? Oh, um, I've got a lot. Uh, let's, I'll just do each one. Um, in basketball, probably in my favorite moments are – like one of my favorite moments was in high school um, when we had a uh, – I played on the team in high school and we had a, uh, an assembly for the beginning of the basketball season. So I had moved schools. I had moved, um, about 35 miles away from where I grew up kind of out to a place that felt a little more country to, 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 from where I was. And I was a little different and I, you know, was trying to fit in, uh, and find my place. And these were all kids that had gone through junior high and elementary and high school together. And I was already a junior at this point in high school. And so, you know, I was trying to make new friends and try to fit into a different environment and stuff. And when, and I tried out for the basketball team and I made it and, uh, we were going to have an assembly where they, we would come out and, and kind of do a, they kind of introduced the team was kind of the deal for, for the year. And, um, we asked if, if we were allowed to dunk, in this little, you know, thing that they were doing. And they said, yes. And I thought, oh, this will be sweet. I'll do a dunk, you know, I'll do like a, a sweet dunk or whatever. And, uh, and I did, uh, it was kind of cool. Cause I, to be honest, like I had a lot of work to do as far as my basketball game went at the time I was trying to fit into a new system and all this stuff. And I was pretty raw. Um, but you know, I had, I played it basically every day, just, you know, uh, with, friends and at the YMCA and stuff like that. Anyway, and I came out and, and I dunked it. And I remember one of the, uh, one of my teachers later on in the day, um, I don't know, he came up with some, I think he called me the sheriff, like a play on my first name. I can't remember. But anyway, he said something and, and everybody in the, in the class, like was like, oh yeah, or whatever. And, and I just remember feeling like that was my first step towards kind of being a little bit more accepted at that school, um, at that point. And then, uh, uh, cause boy, did they value athletics at that school? I, it was way different than the one I was at before. Anyway, um, in poker, I don't know. I, my, my greatest moments have been like winning huge pots. Basically that's it. Like nothing, you know, super spectacular, um, with that stuff. Uh, just, you know, I've won some very, very sizable pots, you know, at least relative for me or whatever. And I've just been like, that felt awesome. Uh, in magic, uh, some of my best moments were, uh, top eighting, a my first PTQ, uh, not the first one I played, but the first time I top eighted a PTQ was the last PTQ in Seattle before they switched to the PPTQ and RPTQ system. So that was pretty cool. Um, another one was, uh, I made day two on camera at GP, uh, Salt Lake city a few years ago. And, uh, I basically, they watched me build my sealed deck. I had no buys. They watched me lose in the first round. <laughs> then I won all the way back to be playing for day two. And I mulliganed to four uh, against my opponent. And my opponent got color screwed while I was mana screwed. And I actually ended up winning a super close game on camera. And, <laughs> you know, I don't get to be on camera on that side of it very often. And, and I ended up uh, making it to day two. And then I went 2-1-2-1 two, one, two, one in both of my drafts. So I finished 11-4, and four, which I've done th three times at GPs, I think. Um, next is from AJ who says, Hey Marshall, I had a question about handling negativity as a content creator. You've been doing this long enough that I hope, uh, you know, uh, you, that you make stuff to be proud of and that you're good at what you do. That doesn't stop random folks on the internet from saying really mean things. It means it seems that every person who puts themselves out there online always has a very vocal minority who want, works to tear them down. And sometimes their legitimate criticism makes it hard to outright ignore them. How much have you personally dealt with this side of the job and what are your personal tips for dealing with it? Thanks for the great content. Well, this is one of the best questions we've ever had, AJ, and this is a very, very real thing. Uh, when I started doing the podcast, I had no, I, I didn't, you know, I barely had a Twitter account. And I had 10 people on it or, you know, nothing. Then when I started doing coverage, um, you know, I had never been in front of a camera really in any capacity. So these were very major changes for me. And what tends to happen is, is that when you're new, uh, people get very excited and then they think that you're great and they like what you add. And then after they get used to you is when they start to see your weaknesses and everybody has these. And then there's also the trolls and these, this is very, very, very real. Um, it took me like years to try to get used to this because I'm not the type of person that likes to just ignore 
I don't work that way. If somebody has feedback for me, even if it's harsh, I'd rather just listen to it. And if I determine that that person is, is stupid or senseless or saying dumb stuff, then I can ignore that. But I would prefer to engage rather than just to say like, haters going to hate or brush my shoulder off and don't care. I don't really roll that way. I take things to heart and it's just how I am. And I have had some really tough times with this stuff. Um, uh, there's, it's just so difficult when you, if somebody just says something about you, that's surface level, that's clearly just a troll. Th those are actually quite easy to ignore. It's when they have kernels of truth or when they're cl claiming things about you that aren't true or things like that. That's when things get really tough because the problem is, is that you can't interact. You just can't. Like if somebody says, hey, you're an idiot and you should never be doing coverage. I can't reply to that. I can't get online and say, oh, yeah, buddy. Well, what about you? Or it, it, all that is, is feeding the trolls. And I firm, I firmly believe in not feeding the trolls. I just think letting them get a reaction out of you or interacting with them is just an invite to waste your time because they're not genuine people. They're not bringing real criticism to you that you can actually work on or that they want to talk about. They're just trying to get a rise out of you or hurt your feelings. The problem is it works. <laughs> they do get a rise out of me and it does hurt my feelings. And that part has been it took me a really long time and I've seen a lot of my coworkers struggle with it in a major way. And I've tried to help them out as the best I could as, as I've gotten more used to it and developed a thicker skin. But the truth is it always gets you. And, uh, depending on what your personality type is, and it's just a cost, it's a cost of doing business as, as it were, it's, it's, it's what you, it's part of the deal when you do this. And I think that trying to fight it in any other way is futile. Um, I will obviously speak against it whenever I can and, 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 advise people to do what they can do. But the truth is, is that it's just hard. Uh, and I, I don't think that people really understand it, um, until you've been on the other side of it. But I mean, I've seen my coworkers cry after events from what people said in the chat or whatever. And I'm not even talking about like harassment level stuff. I'm just talking about like, this person sucks. Why are they here? Or, you know, I bring on these other people. They're better than this, but you know, just these things, they, they hurt. They really do. So yeah, AJ, uh, it, it is real. Uh, it is something that you have to be prepared for if you're going to put yourself in the public sphere and it sucks. It's, it's awful. And I've seen people quit jobs because of it. And I felt like I wanted to many times as well. Um, so yeah, a little bit serious there, but it is real. It is a real deal. Uh, next question comes from Brian who says, when you guys talk about win percentage on the show, as in top players have a win percentage of 65%, are you talking about games or matches. We are talking about matches. Dan G says, Hey Marshall, uh, this show is a great idea. Thanks for showing up and making it happen each and every week. I wanted to ask what brought you to Seattle. Oh, to the Seattle area, or are you originally from here and what makes you want to stay? That's a good question, Dan, because, uh, if you ask around, uh, the Seattle area, most of the people here aren't from here. I actually am. Uh, I was born in Seattle, um, and I've lived here my entire life. Uh, I grew up just outside of Seattle in one of the suburbs of Seattle. And then when I moved, like I mentioned, um, uh, for high school, uh, I moved about 40 minutes away and then I moved back, uh, to another suburb of Seattle. And now I live in Seattle proper again. And, uh, I love this city. Um, I'm super, super, super lucky to have born and raised, to been born and raised here. My parents are from here. My grandparents are also from here as well. Um, so we've, we've been, uh, Seattle people for a long time and it's a certain way of life and approach to things out here that is a little different than everywhere else. And it's a great city. Um, it's changed a lot, uh, over the last few years and, and it's got a lot of things going on now that it traditionally hasn't, but overall, I think it's maintained that core. It's also just one of the most beautiful places to live. And yes, it does rain here. No, it doesn't rain as hard as you think. And summer is fantastic. Uh, and I don't think I'm going to move away. I, I've looked at it. It's gotten very expensive to live here. So I've considered it, but really love it here. And, uh, I plan on staying. Jamie says, Hey Marshall, thanks for all the great content. Uh, I've been playing since last October and the podcast has definitely helped me improve as a drafter. My question is lately, I'm usually able to go two one or three Oh three Oh at my local game store or online. However, sometimes I feel like I'm in the midst of building a good deck during a draft reading signals nicely. And then in mid pack two, I feel like everything just falls apart. 
the, this issue occurs maybe one out of every 10 drafts, and then I get a nice 03 on my record. I'm wondering if you have any insights in this type of situation, and if there are any ways to, uh, to better avoid these random draft failures. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Jamie. This happens to everybody. Uh, it turns out that when you're when you deal with a level of randomness that we deal with in a booster draft, uh, not only the booster packs themselves, but also the order in which they're opened and then the players, uh, <laughs> it feels like some players pick at random. Um, this is going to happen. There are going, it, you, the way I would look at it the, to kind of prove this out and to give you an example is uh, at the Pro Tour, uh, Wizards of the Coast does draft viewers. And these are uh, a, a web page where you can look at every pick from every player and you can you can pick the player whose pick you want to see at any given point. And if you look at every pick from every player from at the table, you will see what happens. You'll see a player take a red card, but then the player who's passing to them also take a red card and you go, uh oh, this isn't going to go well. He's going to try to stick to his glory bringer, but she just passed you know, a bunch of non-red cards and took a glory bringer of her own. And there's no way that she's letting go of this. And then, you know, the players to her right are also not in red. So this, this person to the left is never getting anything. They're never getting any red cards and you can watch what happens. This is going to happen a percentage of the time. One out of 10 stands about right to me, Jamie. I don't know the exact numbers, but no, you can't do it. The only thing you can do is scrap it out and learn to try to maximize in those spots, but you you have to recognize that you're maximizing a lower number than you would be in, in an air quotes normal draft. Uh, Erica says, hi, Marshall. Thank you for making an excellent show. This helped uh, so many people, including me, become better at magic. My question is, what qualities do you admire uh, about the top, most about the top players in magic and which of those qualities have you tried to improve yourself? Ooh, that's a good one, Erica. Um, my, the question that, so like, I feel like I have a good understanding of the fundamentals. Uh, I talked about this with Huey and Luis, uh, excuse me, Huey and Ben on the show last week. And, uh, you know, for me, I look at their ruthless application of these principles. There's just no fear or con like, they're just, Ben will just say, I've determined that this is a 51%. So I'm doing it. And he doesn't care the, the other things. It's just, he understands that you, you get your favorable positions and you just apply them repeatedly and then good things happen in the long run. And he, he doesn't really let any of the other stuff bother him. And, and I like that about people like Huey and, and, and Ben. Um, these are the type of things that, that I do, but I do it a little more reluctantly. Like I think about other stuff that I probably shouldn't be and you know, oh, what if I lose or, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, and I really appreciate that about those guys that they just say, nope, this is it. Go. And that's it. That's all they need to know. Adrian says, uh, I once stumbled upon what appeared to be an old blog of yours where you posted uh, card altars you had painted yourself. There haven't been any new pieces since 2013. Prime Speaker Zagana was a good note to finish on. And honestly, I'm still not 100% convinced that, that's, that it's even really you. You've never spoken about any sort of artistic inclinations you have on the show. But if the blog is real, you must have more than a passing interest in it. Do you still do altars, paint, or express yourself artistically in any other non-digital ways? Adrian, that is me. That was me. I used to do card altars as a hobby. I just enjoyed doing it. Um, I did all of the ones on that blog. Um, in fact, I'll put a I'll put a link in the show notes in case any of you want to see what he's talking about. Um, and yes, so I consider myself a creator artist, whatever, you know, stupid term you want to use, but I like making things right. Uh, that's where the impetus for the podcast came from. That's why I started the YouTube channel and these are, and, and that's why I've done photography for a really long time too. I like expressing myself in artistic ways. Um, painting specifically was something that I always wanted to do, but looked too intimidating. I was just scared to do it. I just thought, oh, this looks super hard. Um, and so I decided that altars would be a good middle ground for me because you're kind of building off of somebody else's work. So you don't have to just come up with things from ground zero, but at the same time, you're adding your own personal touch and flair to it. And you're kind of, um, saying, you know, you're making an artistic statement about a piece that's already been done without, you know, it's kind of like training wheels or whatever. The hard part is that it's also very small, intricate work that, you know, adds this extra layer of technical skill to it. Um, but I decided I wanted to learn how to do it. And I did. And I posted every single altar I did on that blog. But then I stopped. Uh, the truth is, is that after I uh, quit my job <laughs> to do 
uh, you know, magic stuff, I was way more busy than I was when I had my 40 hour a week job. Cause I work way more than 40 hours a week on magic stuff. And so, um, I basically couldn't justify taking the time to do them anymore. And I had kind of done it, you know, like I wasn't really doing them for a specific reason. I just enjoyed it. Uh, I made some for my friends, uh, for some of their commander decks and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I, I would still do it if I had more time, but the truth is, is that if I have a, a bit of time to do anything, uh, I'm doing, I'm editing a video or working on a podcast or doing stuff like that. So yeah, that was me though. Um, Mark says, uh, is the one for one podcast ever likely to return? I really enjoyed both your interviewing style and your choice of guests. Um, probably not Mark. So I did a podcast a while ago. I did, I don't know, nine episodes or something of the one for one, which was an interview podcast, non-magic related. And I basically just wanted to, uh, try to kind of, uh, branch out a little bit into non-magic and also to, uh, work out my interview skills. But the truth is, is that with the role that I had on coverage and I had uh, at the time uh, on the news desk uh, for half of it and then in the booth for the rest. Um, and now I don't do news desk anymore, but I got to interview a lot of people. And so I was routinely uh, interviewing people and felt like I really started to get a much better feel for my skill set at that. And that meant that the one for one didn't have as much of a need for me. And so what I decided to do was to branch into a different direction, which was video. And that's why when I started the breakdown channel, and that meant that it kind of pushed out the one for one just because of time constraints. Um, so I probably won't bring it back just because I don't feel like it's a space that I really need to work on, um, or can't really add a whole lot to, but I've been trying to translate those skills into other things. For example, a big part of doing the show, the special episode from last week is you got to interview people and you got to be good at it, right? Like it, people aren't just going to tell you all these great things without you nurturing the conversation or telling them where, where you want to go or getting that good stuff out of them. Um, you know, I, if you listen to the uncut interviews that I had with the, those two guys, I mean, I'm in, I'm, I'm talking a lot, right. I cut myself out of it for the edit because I wanted to get to the meat of what they said, but you know, I'm, I'm in there all the time. And those were skills that I, I helped hone, um, by doing the one for one. So probably not going to come back, but, uh, hopefully some of the other skills that I've learned from that or translate to other stuff. Um, Jeff says, if you could interview anyone about magic, whether or not they're an entrenched member of the magic community, um, who would it be? Oh, Jeff, boy. Um, you know, the first names that pop to mind are the, the old school people like Richard Garfield. Um, but I have heard many interviews with Richard and I've even had a, a short chat with him once and uh, he's great. Uh, he's actually a really good interview too. So he would be cool. Um, but I don't think he'd be the one. Um, maybe somebody from the early days of the pro tour, um, like a Scaphalias, uh, who was a, a big part of starting the pro tour and what the goals were for that. I think I would probably pick that person just to, you know, it's still here. I, I, they, I'm sure that they have to be shocked. I can't believe that this is still around after all these years, not just the game, but the, the pro tour itself. Um, Ray says, hi, Marshall, what do you think the mix uh, is between competitive versus casual players who watch coverage currently as, a, as magic becomes more popular. I imagine there are a growing number of casual players. Some Twitter comments after GP Vegas were lobbying for more pros on coverage. I assume the goal is more higher level analysis. What are your thoughts and approach? Oops. <laughs> That's funny. I have to mute this. <laughs> That's really funny. The program I'm using to record has the end music for LR, so maybe it's telling me I'm done. Uh, anyway, um, Ray, uh, so to your question, um, what do I think the mix is currently? I don't know exactly. Uh, Wizards of the Coast has done a little bit of uh, stuff like that in the past, but I, I don't. I'm not privy to that information. That's internal for for Wizards uh, employees and not outsiders. Um, I aim a little high, like my, my thinking on it is this. So like, if I look at YouTube and the, the people that, that consume magic content, like this podcast and, and YouTube videos and stuff like that, what I think is this, this is my theory. So the, all content creators want to try to hit this mystical 
group of people called casuals because we're told that there's, you know, 20 million people that play magic, but only a few hundred thousand actually listen to podcasts and watch videos and stuff, right? If we have 20 million magic players, why aren't half of them, you know, watching stuff about magic or whatever? And what I, my take on it is this, the, if you watch videos, read articles or watch coverage, you are no longer a casual player. You, this has now become one of your major hobbies and you're not the type of person that goes to a pre-release, buys a few new packs and then waits around for the next pre-release to come out. You are now a full-fledged magic player. Now you may not be as dedicated as some of uh, you know, our, our listeners and, and the people that we know in the community. You may not go play GPs. You may not be a big tournament person. You may not even keep up on every little thing like the banned and restricted stuff and all that. But if you're consuming magic content, you're no longer a casual. So that's how I see it. And so when I think about who's watching the stream uh, in the booth, my thinking is this. You're not a new casual player, but we need to make sure that newer casual players don't get completely left in the dust because they may dip their toe in. And if they see something that they like, they may come back. Right. And we may even just pick up random people if we happen to be on the front page of Twitch and somebody goes, what's this? I've never played this before. We don't want to be so entrenched that that person just could never even have a fathoming of what's going on. But we have to also respect the fact that likely the majority of our audience does have an idea of what's going on with magic as a game and maybe needs to be told some of the more up to date stuff about what's going on in standard or how this draft format works or what cards are good and that kind of stuff. So I focus on those people, but always try to craft my commentary to leave the door open for a newer player to be able to have access. I think that that's really key. And that's why you won't hear me use like hardcore ma magic slang. Like I'll use all the Look, I think that in order to be a magic player, you need to know some of the slang. It's part of the deal, right? You need to know what the word mill means. Or if I say I swing with my creatures, you need to understand that that means I'm attacking with them. These type of things I just think you need to know. Bounce, a bear, right? All of these little slang things. I think that's part of our culture and part of what makes you a magic player. But when we come up with nicknames for cards that are way off the wall, you know, that just don't, you know, necessarily translate and you throw those out there and you don't explain it. I think that you're playing to the hardcore crowd and they like it and they will say so on Reddit or in the, in the uh, comments or whatever. But I don't think you're, I think you're doing a disservice to the greater community who doesn't know what young peasy means or, you know, some other nickname that, that you came up with or that a few people know, or that you might be able to figure out. Um, and so I, I stay away from that. I think that that's actively bad thing. David says, Marshall, are you st still playing poker? Seems like we don't hear about it as much these days. Yes, I do not play poker that much these days. Uh, basically what happened was, is when I quit my job, um, I was doing the, the podcast and trying to see if I could turn that into a, you know, a career option. And I knew that I was going to be making a lot less money for a while. And, and also spending a lot of money, which, you know, like to get my YouTube channel and to get the LR and stuff off the ground, uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of uh, money. It just does. You need equipment and all that kind of stuff. And so I, uh, switched, I, I was playing poker for, you know, over half of my income during that stretch. Cause I knew what my win rate was and I could sit down and just play for however many hours I needed to. And over the long term, get that win rate. So that, that was more important. But as I took on more and more for coverage for the podcast and for the YouTube channel, I was able to sort of slowly step back further and further from that. And now I play for fun. I mean, I played this week and I'll play here and there. Uh, it's not like completely out of my life, but I'm really working hard at trying to get myself set up where I don't need to play at all. And I've been kind of moved all in with the YouTube channel in conjunction with the podcast and the coverage. So that's kind of my, my goals are to have uh, each of those things set up so that I don't have to play poker. Cause, um, I, while I, I, I still like it and have a passion for it to a point, I, I like making stuff more. So that's it. Rob says, uh, howdy Marshall. I spent some time between rounds and events at GP Dallas Fort Worth last month, hanging around near the coverage area to meet, get play mat signatures, pictures, and have chats with the group as well as some of the pros who are around there. How much of a mini community is built by the mixing of pro and coverage crew crowds and uh, 
and and does it make it more fun when traveling to these events uh, at such a frequency to know that you've got an opportunity to experience the event with these folks? Um, huge. It's a big community, Rob. It is uh, in many ways my social circle now. Um, there is no difference. Uh, the pros, the, the people, basically the pros, the judges, the people that run the tournaments, everybody that's out at these things routinely has become kind of this big extended f- friends and family group. And, uh, you know, I consider many of those, you know, I hang out with them all the time. I talk to them, you know, th- these people are my people and they're people that are like me and view the world in a similar way. And so, yeah, you, what you saw was very much a lot of people that care a lot about each other, um, you know, interacting in, in a good way. Next uh, is Will, who says, great idea, Marshall. Uh, What are your feelings about MTG flavor, story, and art? Do you pay much attention to it? Does the card art ever impact your decision-making feelings about a set of cards? Uh, Love the show, and thanks for all the help. Thanks, Will. Um, uh, Two different things there. Uh, MTG flavor and story I don't care about and I don't pay attention to. I've just never gotten into it. Um, I hear stuff sort of third party. So I will have an idea of what's going on in some of the, some of the sets and stuff, because it's just, I'm just kind of around it, but I never seek it out. I don't read the books or the articles. I just don't care. Uh, I'm more about the strategy stuff. Um, but the art I do love, uh, I'm a very sort of aesthetically minded person. I, you know, I did the altars, I do photography, I do the videos. Like these are all things that uh, really appeal to me and the artwork I do. I, I, get nostalgic looking at the old artwork and I love that stuff. Um, does it ever affect my feelings or decision-making? No, I don't think so. I mean, I might just say, wow, the art for this set's really good, but if it's bad, I don't care. Like, and, and even the bad art these days is, is still very good. Um, Eric says, I'm curious to know if you've ever played different limited formats against one another. Or like he says, the subtext of the question is basically, are some limited formats more powerful than others? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I have never done that. Like the closest thing that you get is grab bag, but then it's sort of everything. But it's like if I took like a a random deck from Innistrad and played it against a a deck from Dominaria, what would happen? That type of thing. Um, I think you generally see a trend towards more powerful later, but with the very, very, because, you know, of of, of card uh, power creep. But one extremely notable exception is that there was a time for a very long time when they printed really premium level uh removal spells at common and that time stopped about i don't know five years ago or something so that the removal would not stack up well but the creatures would absolutely trounce any of the creatures on the other side so i'd still take the newer sets i think if uh if i had to bet on it um seth says hey marshall uh, what are some non MTG media books, movies, music, et cetera, that you've enjoyed lately? Uh, do you find that other media affects how you approach content creation? Absolutely. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts and that's part of where I got the inspiration to do the show, um, that we aired last week, um, was these other ones that I just thought, God, these guys are getting so deep on these subjects and really crafting these narratives. And I'm like, I wish I want to try that, you know? So I mentioned some of the podcasts, but you know, uh, let me just grab my phone actually. And I'll just tell you, uh, I love listening to podcasts like, uh, the Bill Simmons podcast is one that I love. Uh, that's a conversational podcast, um, but I love it. 99% Invisible is pretty good. Uh, Embedded is one that I listen to. Freakonomics Radio. Um, I listen to some basketball podcasts like The Low Post and The Ringer NBA Show. Um, I listen to Mac Break Weekly. Uh, that's a, uh, you know, a tech podcast focusing on Apple stuff, uh, political stuff. I listen to a lot of these days. I listen to pod save America and pod save the world. I also listen to stay tuned with uh pre Um, I, I like those shows a lot as more conversational again, but stuff that you can get into, um, those type of things I love. Um, when it comes to films and, and TV shows, I get taken back sometimes by the cinematography because after having done the vlog for a long time and done photography for most of my life now, um, I do view the world through that kind of lens. So it's been uh, really interesting to see how other artists, you know, are able to set those things up. And I try to think about what I could do for my stuff to improve it. So that happens a lot. Um, yeah, Oh, there you go, Seth. Jake says, uh, love the special edition. He says, so cabs and Uber seem to be two of the most fundamental level one archetypes for limited decks, according to the LR philosophy. Do all playable limited decks fall into either the cabs or the Uber models or are, de- are there decks outside of them? If there are, what would they be and how would you identify which, when it's right to play them? 
Good stuff, Jake. Um, so cabs and Uber, you know, are theoretical archetypes that represent not bookends. Um, you know, cabs, a cab stack doesn't have, it's generally a, an assertive deck, but it, it's not like the most aggressive and Uber tends to be a much more slow deck, but it's also not the slowest possible or the weirdest or whatever. The truth is, is that almost all limited decks fall in between the, the goalposts of aggro and control. They're almost all versions of a mid range deck. And even cabs and Uber decks would fall into those categories as well. So when you want to think about things like that, cabs and Uber do tend to fall on the, the spectrum somewhere, but they're almost all in between. And while they do represent two fundamental styles of play, th they are more like theoretical examples rather than optimal scenarios, right? Like I mentioned during the cabs episode that, uh, you know, you want to take, again, the whole idea being cards that affect the board state. And what that really means, though, is that you're not taking cards that are you spend mana, nothing happens. You're trying to really dial in on that idea of it's got to be a combat trick or removal spell or a creature, basically. But the truth is, is that the optimal builds, and I talked about this on the show, but the optimal builds for limited decks don't usually include only combat tricks, removal spells, and creatures. There are usually spells that uh, that can help you win percentage more than one of those that aren't those things. Cards like card draw spells might be one of them, or you know, a weird artifact that does something that you know you you wouldn't that don't that doesn't fit that description, but can be very very powerful. Right? These things pop up all the time. Um, so your generality is actually in between them. These are level one archetypes, but they're they're meant to be uh, sort of uh, extreme in that way. Steve says, hi, Marshall. Um, apologies if you've already answered this. Uh, I really admire the way you've made your passion for magic and creating content into a career. I'm an indie comic book writer by passion with an admittedly cushy day job doing other things by necessity. Uh, I'm having a hard time finding the right point to push off and make my passion into my full-time work, and I'm worried that I won't ever do it unless I really take a chance and jump in headfirst. Any words of advice as to how you recognize when the time was right and how you felt confident taking that leap? Absolutely, Steve. Um, first things first, I did not feel confident taking that leap. Um, I did not know for sure if this was going to work. I knew I was going to give it my best shot and I knew that I had a chance, but th I knew for sure that there was a very probable outcome that said, yeah, you're not going to be able to, to put together an income doing this stuff and it's just not going to work out. So you can keep it a part of your life, but you're going to have to go back to the trenches and, uh, you know, find something that pays better. Um, so my advice for this is to not jump until you have something to jump towards. So for example, for me, I didn't start the podcast and then a week later go, this is what I want to do. I'm quitting my job. I did the podcast for years, like actual years, like multiple co-hosts years before I quit my job, uh, like for almost four years. I had been doing the show. Now let that sink in. That's a long time. And I did it every single week and we did it for, you know, well over a year, maybe a year and a half with getting no sponsorship or pay or anything. We just did it because we loved it. Then when we got one, like, I'll just tell you what, we were getting $75 per show. And with two people, <laughs> it was me and Ryan, you know, n you know, now we're splitting up our, our 75, you know, so we're getting $30. Now I had already spent hundreds of dollars on software and, and mics and stuff. I mean, it, we, we were not making money, right? We were still very much losing money, but it wasn't a ton and we still loved doing it and it was fine. But the point of the show that time, you know, we weren't, that wasn't why we did it. Um, I viewed it as an opportunity at some point because I recognized the power of crowdfunding, right? Of Kickstarter and then what would become ultimately Patreon were, were things that were coming in, to the worldview or had kind of become that. And I said, there could be an opportunity here, uh, you know, for this, because I thought to myself, well, I would do that. Like I already had, in fact, uh, you know, supported some of the things that I liked and I thought, well, maybe we could too. So the, the key here, Steve, is that you get something 
get the ball rolling and get kind of like a proof of concept, right? Like, for example, for the podcast, I did not have a proof of concept on anything other than that it could be sponsored because it was and that we had a good listener base, right? Like I knew what our numbers were at the time and we had a good listener base going. So I knew at that time, you know, that this was something that I could for sure build off of. If you have an idea for a comic and it's a really good idea, that's probably not enough to give up your career for the stretch. Because what happens when you quit is two things. Your income stops. So you are no longer making money and you need to spend money to properly launch and do the things that you're trying to do. So it works against you in both ways. You, you're, you will watch your money just evaporate, you know, the savings that you have. And it will, and it's not being replenished. It's very scary. Uh, so, and I was, you know, stressed out by it. I mean, I was, I knew I was taking a shot and I didn't know exactly what the waters looked like because when I went, nobody in magic had done any type of anything like that when I did the Kickstarter and I was, you know, basically the first magic podcast on Patreon. So these were not proven models. Now it's become the standard that you just do that. And I think that's great. But at the time, I was taking a major life risk on doing it, and I would have had to go find a new job and do all this other stuff. So basically, again, to reiterate, uh, make sure that you have something to jump towards. And then when you do it, set aside a certain time frame. I told myself I would give myself six to eight months to really take the time needed to do this properly, and we'd see where it went after the Kickstarter. That was my goal. And as it turned out, the Kickstarter did really good, and that bought me another year. Uh, of doing the show. And then when that year expired is when I moved over to, to Patreon to see how that went. And, you know, again, thanks, thanks to our great listeners, we've been able to do that too. And so, you know, each thing came step by step. Now I will tell you though, Steve, the really great part about it all is that there is a direct correlation to how much work you put in to how much you get back out of it. And that wasn't true at my old job. I was on kind of a track, you know, I could get a raise every year or something, but it wasn't much. And that was just kind of be kind of what it was. Where here, I can say, all right, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. And then like, I've been doing that for almost a year now. And I'm going to start a Patreon for it at some point so I can do more stuff on it. And like, I could have just not done any of that and just stayed where I'm at. But I decided to work harder and put in more and, and develop it and do it. And it's up to you. So with your comics, you can do one or you can do more and uh, and see how it goes. In any case, good luck, Steve. I wish you I wish you all the best with it. Just be smart about it, but I think you know you can do it. It does happen. A few more questions. Rob says, I need some shoring up on a draft weakness. I don't know how to draft blue. Blue, that's the best color, Rob. When I compare blue cards to cards in other colors, I'm not properly evaluating the blue cards, so I often determine too late the blue is open. Uh, so first, let's assume that Cloud Reader Sphinx is the best blue common and Eviscerate is the best black common and Dominaria is the best... Common and black removal spell, always better than the best blue common. What about commons and their colors? I think I understand the other colors, but what in general is blue trying to do? I see card draw, bad removal, and uh, small creatures, and I feel underwhelmed. How should I evaluate blue and its game plan? Ooh, we got to shore this one up for you, Rob, because blue is the best. Um, Generally speaking, blue is a card that you should always think of in terms of how it pairs with other colors because blue on its own is actually lacking uh, the, the, for the reasons that you said where, you know, there's other colors like say black that aren't like they have creatures, they have removal spells. They kind of have all the things that you need. Red often has a similar thing. Green less. So white does though, like think of white, they have creatures, they have removal. They often have combat tricks. They have some weird stuff. You kind of have all your bases covered. And if you viewed in a vacuum, you think this color is good. Blue often lacks B- blue often has gaping holes in its game plan that don't work out and that you that you're worried about like hard removal so when you think about blue the way to do it is to think about it in in companionship with other colors so you think about well okay blue does these things like it has evasion and some tempo cards and some card draw but how am i going to take advantage of these well i could pair it with white where the tempo cards become very good because blue and white both have good flying creatures, generally speaking. And now all of a sudden these tempo plays buy me just enough time to kill you. So they effectively act as a removal spell where if I say blue, black, black doesn't have those type of flyers available to it, generally speaking. So now the tempo spells don't look as good because I need to live. But guess what black gives you? Removal, hard removal that you can now use to leverage. That's right. 
the card draw that blue gets you. So now you're going to be focusing instead on tempo plays on card draw spells and that kind of thing. So basically, that's how you want to approach it. Think of blue in conjunction with another color, and then you'll have a better idea for what it's trying to do in each format. Next question comes from Ashok, who says, oftentimes in sealed, I see people build two sealed decks with their pool and sideboard into another deck. I was curious uh, what circumstances would occur during deck building that would lead to a two deck situation. Shouldn't you always play your best deck? I was also curious that uh, when someone who has two decks would switch uh, on their opponent, is it for the element of surprise, a better matchup or both? So not every sealed pool is going to give you two playable decks. What you'll usually see is one deck that's good and then one that's close, but not as good, but has a much different game plan. Like you'll have one really good sort of solid mid-range style deck, and then you'll have this, you know, red-white deck that is good and quick, but doesn't quite have the punch or the late game that your other deck does, or maybe is lacking a removal spell or two or something like that. Um, And so that's usually what will happen is that the two decks are significantly different, but one slightly better than the other. When to switch and which one to start with is usually just a power level consideration. You just say, which is the best option? Like this is the most powerful deck, so I'll start with it. But you get a double bonus when you switch because let's say you play against your opponent with your good deck, but it's slow and their deck's really slow. So they beat you in game one because guess what? Their really slow deck is just slightly slower than your slow deck and they have more powerful stuff. So that's bad for you. So now they switch out a bunch of cards thinking that you're going to play this deck again and you bring in your red, white fast deck. Now you get the element of surprise you get the fact that they sideboarded incorrectly and you get to just pounce all over them in a, in a matchup that is favorable for you where maybe you play another mid range deck and uh, you don't want to do that later on. So it's basically just a question of, is this a better matchup for the deck that I'm doing? It's not so much just for the surprise element though, that you do get some equity from that, uh, especially in the later games after people have sideboarded against what they think is your strategy. And look, if you see your opponent, this is another uh, tip that we've we've said before is that you should always pretend to sideboard at least a couple of cards, even if it's just taking a card out and putting it back in its sleeve. Because let's say your opponent isn't pretending and you know they're not, like you watch them intently and you just tell that they're not, and they bring in five cards for your slow deck. You bring in your fast deck, they just completely re-geared their entire deck. Like they took out a huge chunk of the cards and probably slowed their deck down even more, right? They're taking out the cheap removal spells and putting in the card draw and the bombs and stuff, and now, now you're getting them. So keep that in mind. Last question comes from Dylan, who says, Hey, Marshall, big fan. As another fellow member of the Sultai Brood, what pulls you towards these colors? I have friends that are drawn towards other colors. I've had my fair share of experiment in all the color pairs. Uh, to see their value, but my friends seem to have a hard time jumping out of their comfort zones. How would you convince another player to check out something they've missed out on? Thanks. Love the show. Um, well, I'm drawn to these colors because they are the colors of value. And I mean that, like, I'm not just saying that as a joke, like you get card draw, you get, um, you get removal and you get good creatures. And and I love th- that aspect of, of, uh, red, green, and black. And that is why it's my favorite, uh, three color combination. Um, when it comes to other color pairs, I mean, and, and trios and stuff, I, I play all of them. Like when it comes to draft or whatever, I, I don't force anything like that. I mean, my Canadian Highlander deck is Sultai because I got to choose that. But when in limited, I don't, I don't force that unless I think it's really good in the format or something like that. Um, getting your friends to see other colors. Look, they're going to have to do it. Basically, I would appeal to their competitive side if they have it. If they don't, then just don't worry about it. Because there's, I mean... If you just want to play magic because you enjoy it, then just do it. It doesn't, you know, you don't need to convince them. But if they, if they're, it's kind of like this. I would tell them this. I would say you can complain about losing or stick to your color preferences, but you can't have both. (laughs) You're not allowed to say, I only draft red, white, and then complain about losing because you're just not maximizing in the draft. And if you want to win, you need to do that. So they're going to have to be able to play all the colors and all the color pairs and all the combinations well if they're going to be really good at at draft or at at limited and you're just going to have to be blunt with them and say look there's just no other like you just have to do that and if you lose as a result so be it maybe you had more fun but you accepted before you uh sat down to draft that that was going to be the case because yeah you're just giving up equity if you don't uh branch out all right that's going to do it for this one thanks a lot 
uh, for hanging out with me here and, and having me answer all these questions. And of course, everybody for sending them in. And I uh, also want to say thank you to Woody. Uh, for coming on the show and giving us a little bit of a perspective from maybe you, uh, you know, I, again, I wanted to say it. I, you know, we teach you how to get to that next level and I expect you to, I, I think that if you do the things we say on the show, apply your own logic, put in the work that you're going to make it to the pro tour, if that's your goal, and you're going to make it to day two of the GP and you're going to win a PPTQ or an RPTQ. And you need to know what this next steps actually look like from a player who's done it. And that's why, uh, that's why Woody came on the show this week. And, uh, again, I wanted to say thank you. And also, well, he wanted to do a sign off and he did. And here it is. So I didn't have anything written this week, but I've got no end of uh, funny stories. So we figured we would just tell one of those for the, the sign off this week. So this mm -hmm. one took place at Nationals. Um, this, this was also in Richmond. And, uh, you know, Nationals is it's not it's not quite the PT, but it's kind of a, it's another prestigious tournament, you know, where you have to have a specific uh I don't actually know how I qualified. I just it was <laughs> I just, a planeswalker points yeah, threshold. So, yeah. Right. So I, I ended up qualifying. And I went out there, and this was uh, Ixalan block, um, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're playing Ixalan, and I'm in a, a draft. Um, so the board state sits like this. I have a four-powered flyer in the air. It's uh, a 2-2 two -two flyer with a machete attached to it. And I've got a couple of random small creatures, one ones. I think I was Merfolk. And I've got one 3-2. My opponent has a 3-2 that has Mark of the Vampire, which makes it a 5-4 lifelinker. And he's just played Anointed Deacon, which gives a uh, vampire plus 2, plus 0 at the beginning of each combat. So he, he's threatening a 7-powered lifelinker next turn attacking, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, my opponent's at 5, and I have a 4-powered creature in, in the air. So I draw my card, and it's a creature. It's just a, some random vanilla creature. And for some reason, I, I'm looking at this board, and I just completely miss that the 5-4 the lifelinker is a 5-4 and not a 5-3. So <laughs> I, for some reason, I just think, okay, well, if I attack, he's got to trade with either. He's going to trade with the deacon, but you know, at least then he doesn't get the, the next, you know, the big two point life uh life hit the next turn so i'll be happy either way so i'm like go to attacks and i attack with my my four power flyer and my three two i take my hands off and i look and i go oh no i'm like <laughs> oh my god so so i'm attacking a three two into a five four life linker so i'm like oh my god he's gonna block and he's just gonna go up a life point on this entire exchange and i'm just gonna lose my creature <laughs> and i'm sitting there i've got one card in my hand i have not played it and he is sitting there and then i start to think he's, he's in the tank and i'm starting to think oh my god he can't even play around a pump spell because if i have a pump spell then the stupid flyer kills him like if i have right. any, <laughs> any any plus on power is yeah. the game anyway and, and i'm going through the set and i'm like there is literally nothing that makes this attack make sense <laughs> And so he's sitting there and he's, and he, he's like, God, I just can't figure out what this could possibly be. And he starts to slide the anointed deacon, which is a three, three. And I'm like, Oh, please, 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 please. And he slides it in front of it. And he's like, God, no. And he takes it back and he puts the five, four life linker in front. And he's like, I'm, he's like, these aren't my blocks yet. I'm still thinking. And I'm like, Oh my God. So, <laughs> so he's like, he's like, God, I just, I don't know. He's like, I just, he's like, all right, I, I can't figure it out. So he he takes it away and he puts the the uh, the three three in front of my three two, and I'm like, go to damage. And he's like, yep. Yeah. And so we trade. He goes to one, and I play the creature out of my hand. And he's like, what the hell? And I'm, <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm sorry. I thought it had three toughness. And he's and he, so he's pretty tilted. So he untaps, and he's just like, go. And so I untap and I attack with just my three four flyer. Uh, or, or my four, four power flyer four power. Mm -hmm. and he goes contract killing that and, and he was so <laughs> tilted that he thought that contract killing was an instant instead of a sorcery so he just died like he, he it would have been totally stabilized like he could have just killed it and i would have been facing down this five four life linker but instead he because he didn't attack that was the other thing he didn't attack with his is uh, yeah, he just, he just hastily threw the turn back to you. I think the creature that I played was was big enough to eat it, but it was just a disaster. I mean, it was just, it was just the worst played couple of turns of magic I've ever seen at the, at that level. 
like on, on both ends. It was it was yeah. really bad. Yeah, or like, how I would pitch it is greatest bluff of all time. Yeah, that that would work too, I suppose. <laughs> yeah.